Members of Council, if I can please have you take your seats. Members of Council, please rise for the National Anthem. Please remain standing for a moment of silence, and during this time, please remember the following persons who have passed away, Christy Blatchford, Douglas Burley, Jose Chell, Daniel D'Alosio, Beatrice Ann Hopkins, Michael Lee Zekas, Hopeland Hope Walters, and Her Hermine Weckerly. Thank you. I also uh, want to acknowledge um, for Douglas Burley and Daniel D'Alosio that we do have fire services and family are present in the council chambers. My condolence goes out to the family. We acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. For the benefit of those who are connected to the internet, the city clerk has posted all of the agenda materials for today's meeting at toronto.ca slash council. This special meeting of council is scheduled for the following purposes. To consider the executive committee report from the meeting on February 13, 2020, and to, to introduce and enact a general bill, and to introduce and enact a confirming bill for this special meeting. Members of Council, this is a special meeting. Under Council procedures, no new business items such as notices and motions may be introduced. This rule cannot be waived. I will now call upon the Mayor to introduce the Executive Committee report. Mayor Tor, you have a motion to introduce the Executive Committee report. I do, Speaker. I move that the report uh, from meeting 13 of the Executive Committee listed on the agenda of Council be presented uh, for consideration. And I will just say, uh, consistent with the comments that I just made uh, a few moments ago, that um, I, I, first of all, I want to say thank you. Uh, and I, I, I said a special word of thanks because uh, this is a job uh, many people in this chamber have uh, added responsibilities they carry from time to time to carry the responsibility as being the budget chief for the City of Toronto for now six uh, budgets is extraordinary. Um, and I think it is a testament to his uh, steadiness, uh, to his uh, uh, discipline, his hard work, 
uh, and, and his uh, great sensitivity, I think, to the needs of the city of the people of Toronto in that balanced way that he does things that uh, Councillor Crawford has carried out that responsibility again uh, this year, and it reaches, of course, its, uh, its conclusion today with the Council's formal consideration of the budget. So I want to say thank you to him. Uh, for a job, you know, whatever your, whatever your point of view may be about the budget, and that will unfold as the day unfolds, um, I think you'll acknowledge he's done a hard job, hard job well uh, and does it, I think, with due consideration and, uh, and due respect for all of us and for the people of the City of Toronto. So thank you to him uh, and to our city staff. I mean, again, uh, I think people realize that um, the budget process begins tomorrow morning for the city staff for next year. Uh, it's just a very long uh, and, and uh, incredibly complex and laborious uh, process. Um, I've involved myself in it, uh, you know, actively because I think it's appropriate for a mayor to do so, working alongside Councillor Crawford and the members of the Budget Committee. And the staff work all year on it, though, day in and day out. And I want to thank them for their work uh, on this uh, budget, uh, and, and as well as I said, the members of the Budget Committee. Uh, and I want to thank the members of council. I think um, we'll, we'll see how the day unfolds. I may live to regret these words, but I think that because we have worked with individual councillors to, uh, to an unprecedented extent, I would say, to address issues that have come up along the way that we have a budget that has, uh, on most things, a fairly broad uh, kind of consensus. And uh, I think it is making a lot of the investments that the people, uh, as uh, articulated by you as their representatives, expect us to make. Um, and uh, that will allow us to have a good discussion today with, I'm sure, some divided votes, but that's the nature of a democracy, and I completely respect that. With respect to the budget itself, it's a balancing act, and I think we all know that. And, and one of the things I'm so proud of here, I'm so proud of here, and I, I'm so glad I've had the experience of being here to see this compared to what I saw when I was at Queen's Park, is the transparency of this budget process. From the beginning of, of when it's to be, is put together through to the presentation of the staff budget, the public deputations, the committee hearings, everything happens in the open. And if you compare that, when you think about it for a minute, uh, to the budget process that happens at Queen's Park and in Ottawa, where all of a sudden one day, yes, there's a few hearings here and there, but all of a sudden one day the Minister of Finance, whoever that happens to be, comes forward and just presents the budget. And then if there's a majority government, it's voted, it's voted in, and that's that. I mean, almost, there was almost never any change to it. This was an evolving document that I, uh, as the mayor, uh, suggested some changes to that are incorporated in what you see today on things like investment in kids and families and neighborhoods with help from people like Deputy Mayor Thompson and others. And, uh, you know, I think it's a, it's a process that will have some changes, I'm sure, today. And I think that's so healthy that people can see what's going on and see the priority setting that is taking place. And the final comment I'll make, Speaker, is, is simply to say that um, the other way in which this budget is balanced beyond the technical balancing as between revenues and expenses is the balance uh, in terms of uh, how different investments were made in different things and measuring that or balancing that against the ability that people have to not pay unlimited sums of money. And we will hear today from people who will suggest we should have imposed a much more dramatic tax increase on people. That's an approach that I don't accept. Uh, I think the discipline and the, the need to be vigilant on behalf of people who are in many cases struggling uh, to make all of their different ends meet um, is something that is again captured by this budget where there are some tax increases including the alteration to the city bu building fund which I proudly accept accountability for because it's something necessary for us to do to invest in the success of Toronto but I think otherwise we've achieved a balance including efficiencies found uh, in this very big and complicated uh, government. So I thank the members of council again for their cooperation uh, on with a good discussion today um, and uh, th that is what the executive committee report consists of is the two essential items the uh, tax uh, rate and the budgets themselves, capital and operating, and I'll look forward to discussing it. Thank you, Speaker. All those in favor of the motion? Recorded vote. Recorded Councillor Layden, please. Councillor Fillion, Councillor Perks, Deputy Mayor Minnan Wong, please. A 
The motion to introduce the executive committee report carries unanimously, 21 in favor. Thank you. Are there any declarations of interest? Please indicate the item number and the nature of the interest. And remember that you must also file a written declaration of your interest with the city clerk. Are there any petitions at this? T oh, uh, Mayor Tory. Of course, yeah, I left the form downstairs. And so I will, if you could just put that over for two minutes uh, while you do some petitions or whatever. I just have one that I have to put on the record, so. Okay. Are there any petitions at this time? Councilor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I rise to present some petitions. I've got two uh, in, my, in my hands right now. I will start off with the Save the Cabbage Town Youth Center, uh, signed by 919 residents and business owners uh, in the area and the downtown core. Uh, the petition reads, Cabbage Town Youth Center, CYC, a not-for-profit organization, was founded in 1972 as the Cabbage Town Boxing Club, a boxing club designated to support neighboring youth with sports and recreation opportunities. The CYC has been working to serve the Cabbage Town, St. James Town, and Regent Park neighborhoods for 47 years. As a result of the loss of significant government grants, the center is facing imminent closure. They will no longer be able to maintain their core programming and operations. The City of Toronto currently operates a number of programs designed to support our vision, uh, their vision to address community safety, anti-poverty, youth engagement initiatives with equitable access to recreation services in the downtown east being an ongoing concern. It is imperative that we review operations to increase support for the CYC. This is a timely opportunity to strengthen the city's recreation for all vision through supporting the CYC with interim funding to maintain its operations. And again, this is signed by 919 uh, residents. Um, the second petition, Madam Speaker, is actually, uh, is, is largely in the age of electronic communications, uh, handwritten and collected door by door by the residents of Regent Park. The petition is to fund, asking council to fund the Regent Park Social Development Plan. Uh, in 2007, the city, city council endorsed the city's first social development plan, the Regent Park Social Development Plan, also known as the SDP. The Regent Park SDP is a framework designed to manage change and strengthen community development in the neighborhood throughout and post-revitalization. Recommendations focus on building social inclusion and cohesion through four strategic focus areas safety, employment, economic opportunities, community building, and communications. It's been 13 years since the plan was approved by City Council, yet there has been no financial investments in the social development plan. We are calling on the Mayor and City Councilors to support the, from, to support the call from community members to fund the SDP through the 2020 budget process. Community revitalization is not just about bricks and mortar. Successful community revitalization is one where both the physical infrastructure and social development receive equal commitment and focus. As the Regent Park revitalization is entering the final few phases, it is imperative that City Council commits to supporting the social development plan in Regent Park. And I just want to acknowledge, Madam Speaker, that the SDP table uh, in Regent Park is, uh, is staffed by at least four working groups. And when I say staff, it's largely volunteer driven. Uh, and many of these uh, volunteers are in attendance today uh, to bear the witness of the presentation of this petition uh, to City Council. Uh, they include stakeholder table co-chairs, uh, as well as the Community Building Working Group, Safety Working Group, Employment and Economic Development Working Group, the Communications Working Group, the Planning Committee, as well as community supporters. And I just want to be able to name them off because they've been working for 13 years to this particular point in time. So this is very historic for them. I'd like to acknowledge Paolo Grebius, uh, Lloyd Pike, Ishmael Afra, Murshida Samson Muen, Joel Klassen, Marianne Scott. Councilor Wong Tam. I'm almost finished, Madam Speaker. Introduce the petition. I will, Madam Speaker. I just yes. oh, five more names, Madam Speaker, please. Uh, Dini Peters, Inez uh, Garcia, Neon Kim, Merwan Kugali, Denise Suinden O'Leary, Miguel Avila Verlarde, Diana Mavundes, and uh, as well as John Elvis from the Toronto Center for Community Learning and Development. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Please, member of the council, just to introduce, uh, no applauding, please. Just please introduce your petitions. Councillor Perks. Good morning, Speaker. I have a petition. It is for climate emergency funding in the 2020 budget. 
Whereas the city has declared a climate emergency to respond to the urgent crisis on climate, we need to reduce our emissions by 7.6% year over year each year this decade. To do this, we need to shift car ridership to increase transit use, walking, and cycling. As 52% of emissions are from buildings, we need to ramp up the housing retrofit program help. We, the undersigned Toronto residents, call upon Mayor Tory and City Councillors to support the implementation of a climate emergency with the following specific actions in the 2020 budget. One, a vehicle registration tax. Two, a commercial parking levy. Three, increased funding for the retrofit program. And four, increased funding for transit improvements to keep transit affordable. Thank you. Councillor Fletcher. Yes, so Speaker, I have a petition to the Mayor and Councillors for climate emergency funding in the 2020 budget. And whereas the city has declared a climate emergency to respond to the urgent crisis on climate, we need to reduce emissions by 7.6% each year this decade, per year each year this decade. And to do so, we need to shift car ridership to increase transit use, walking, and cycling. 52% of emissions are from buildings. We also need to ramp up the housing retrofit program help. And this is signed by people, I will say, from across the city. There's many postal codes, M1, M9, M6, M3. Those aren't M4s, which are mine. So I'm proud to present this on behalf of many citizens of the city. Thank you. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. I have a petition to the Mayor and Councillors for climate, uh, climate emergency funding in the 2020 budget. Whereas the response to the urgent crisis on climate change, we need to reduce emissions by 7.6% per year each year for this decade. To do so, we need to shift car ridership to increase transit use, walking, and cycling. As 52% of emissions are from buildings, we need to ramp up the housing retrofit program help. This petition is signed by over 100 people from across the city. Thank you. Councillor Matlow. Madam uh, <clears throat> Speaker, I have a, a petition to the Mayor and Councillors for climate emergency funding in the 2020 budget. Whereas the uh, res response to the urgent crisis on climate, uh, we need to reduce emissions 7.6% per year each year this decade. To do this, we need to shift car ridership to increased transit use, walking, and cycling. As 52% of emissions are from buildings, we need to ramp up the housing retrofit program help. We, the undersigned Toronto residents, call upon Mayor Tory and City Councillors to support the implementation of the Climate Emergency Declaration from October 2019 with the following specific actions in the 2020 budget. One, uh, vehicle registration tax. Two, a commercial parking levy. Three, increased funding for retrofit program. Four, increased funding for transit improvements and to keep transit affordable. There are 100 signatures on the petition. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, rise to present a petition to Mayor and Council uh, for climate emergency funding in 2020 budget. Here as the city has declared a climate emergency to respond to the urgent crisis on climate, we need to reduce emissions 7.6%. Uh, each year this decade. To do this, we need to shift ridership to increase transit use, walking and cycling. As 52% of emissions from buildings, we need to ramp up the housing retrofit uh, program help. Uh, so this is a signature from residents of Beaches East York, six undersigned here, so I'll be presenting that. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor of receiving the petitions, recorded vote. Councillor Wong Tam, please. Councillor Peruzza, please. The motion to receive the petitions carries unanimously 25 in favor. Councillor, um, oh, okay, um, Mayor Tory. Uh, I apologize, Madam Speaker. I was just going to deal with that uh, a declaration of interest matter now because I have the piece of paper that uh, ha that I had uh, signed earlier. 
Uh, and um, in my case, it is to declare an interest in respective item EX 13.2, the capital and operating budgets. Uh, and it's on account of my continuing interest in the uh, Rogers family companies and through that uh, Rogers Communications, uh, which provides uh, tel tel telephone and cellular services and other services to the city. So the first interest is in the 2020 information and technology operating budget, the police services and TTC budget, and Toronto Community Housing as it relates to funds uh, for telephone, wireless, and internet services. The second interest pertains to the strategic communications budget as pertains to funds allocated for news summary services. And finally, an interest regarding the transportation services budget project entitled Rogers Communications Inc. Uplift Project. And I'll file that with the clerk. Thank you. Councillor Fillion, you would like to make an uh, not uh, yes, I'd like to introduce members of the Willowdale Youth Council. Perhaps you could wave. Um, uh, they are here uh, with the permission of their uh, high schools, by the way, to uh, observe the budget process. And hopefully while they're here, they can figure out which uh, of these chairs they might want to sit in in 15 or 20 years. Thank you. Councillor Wong Tam. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I also have a declaration of interest that I'd like to place before uh, Council. Uh, regarding item number EX 13.2, e, um, this is regarding the operating budget uh, for economic development culture and in particular art services. I'm a board member of the Toronto Biennial of Art. Thank you. We will now review and confirm the order paper. Once the order paper has been approved by Council, any change will need a two-thirds vote. The mayor has identified item EX 13.1 on the 2020 property tax rates and related matters as this first key matter. Item EX 13.2 on the 2020 capital and operating budget is the mayor's second key matter. These will be our first items of business today. We have scheduled to meet until 6 p.m. tonight. We will take a scheduled recess between 12.30 and 2 p.m. and council will reconvene tomorrow at 9.30 a.m. if necessary. Members will have an opportunity to ask questions on each of the executive committee items when the items come up for debate. Members, we have three items before, before us. Items one and two will be debated, but does anyone wish to hold item three? All those in favor of adopting the order paper recorded vote. Councillor Matlow, please, your vote. The motion to adopt the order paper carries unanimously 25 in favour. Thank you. Members, I am expecting that there will be a number of motions today to ensure that members and the public understand the motions that are placed. Members are reminded to work with the clerk staff to prepare your motions. This will enable the clerk staff to display them. Members are also reminded to state their motions before they speak. So we'll go to the Mayor's Key Item EX 13.1. Questions to staff. Uh, if you have questions to staff, if you can put your name on your request to question staff. Councillor Perks. Thank you, Speaker. Um, I'm going to have questions for a few people uh, as a heads up transportation, PFR, TTC library, and the CFO. Uh, to the general manager of transportation, uh, with the uh, revenues proposed in this budget, uh, what is the long term forecast for your state of good repair budget? What is it now, and what will it be in a decade? Uh, through the speaker, uh, one moment, Councillor Perks, we're looking for that information. So uh, our uh, 2020 projected, uh, our recommended budget is $190 um, million, is that right? 
there. Here at 90 million. So state of good repairs at the total backlog is. Total backlog in 2019 is 3.2 billion. The total backlog in 2019 is 3.2 billion. And the in, uh, 2029, in 2029, that would grow to just over 4 billion. Thank you. So, uh, the general manager of Parks, Forest, Recreation, could you answer the same question? Same question through you, Madam Speaker. So uh, our current backlog uh, is $559 million for state of good repair. Our projected backlog at the end of the 10-year plan will be uh, $659 million. And in the existing 10-year plan before Council right now, we have approximately $600 million uh, dedicated towards state of good repair projects. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Leary. I just want to remind uh, Councillor Perks, we are EX 13.1, which is the tax rate. Yes, taxes pay for yes. these things. Yes. So if you can keep your questions to the tax rate, please. Taxes pay for these things. Money in, money out. That's why I'm asking about how much money is coming in and what it's covering. Good morning, Ms. Levita. Uh, what is the, with the budget that's being presented now, including the revenue proposals, uh, you currently have a state of good repair backlog. What is it now and what will it be in 10 years? So through the chair, uh, the backlog starting in uh, 2020 is roughly about 71 million, but it will grow over the 10 year period to 7.8 billion and represents- and that's inclusive. Is that inclusive of uh, the decisions recently taken? It's uh, it's our best estimate at this point, but we will be refining it given the, depending on what happens with our vehicle purchases. Okay, thank you. Uh, to the city librarian, Ms. Bowles. Hello, Ms. Bowles. With the um, budget that's in front of us and the revenues that are in it, we had currently have a state of good repair backlog at the library and project it to grow over the next 10 years. What, will, what is it today and what will it be in 10 years? It's uh, 120 million uh, now and it will grow to about 165 million. Thank you very much. Um, additionally, <clears throat> In the budget submission uh, from the library board, excuse me, <clears throat> in the budget submission from the library board, uh, the library board voted unanimously both uh, before the budget was launched and again after the budget was launched, asking for funding for uh, two phases of the open hours program. Are, is that budget request met in this budget? I uh, know it's not. What is the dollar value of that budget request? Uh, annualized, it's so it's approximately five and a half million dollars in 2020. Thank you very much. Uh, finally, to the CFO, uh, the budget that's presented here with the revenue stream as proposed uh, expands our state of good repair backlog generally, exclusive of the Gardner Expressway. What is the state of good repair? backlog generally in the city now and what will it be in 10 years? Through you, Madam Speaker, um, I'll have to take a moment to exclude the Gardner, but on a total for our tax supported. In 2019, it's about 6.5 billion and it's expected to grow to about 8.3 billion. Okay. Um, and speaker, if you'll indulge me, I waited like 30 seconds. I have one final question. There was a briefing note on uh, the balance of reserve accounts that came. It showed, if I remember correctly, that we are net drawing on reserve accounts this year. We're projecting a larger draw next year and a still larger draw the year after. That was your last question. Um, through you, Madam Speaker, I'll have to go through the details, but what we did through the briefing note this year is separate the operating draws versus the capital because the capitals will fluctuate in nature. On the operating side, we have a net positive contribution to the reserves that are associated with the operating budget. Thank you. 
Please keep your questions to the tax rate. Councillor Fletcher. Um, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions. And I hope it's uh, in order because it's actually about the um, property tax increase cancellation program. Is that somebody can answer that? Sorry, over here. Thank you, Mr. Brennan. Um, we have a property tax increase cancellation program and a property tax deferral program. And that is for cancellation for those households combined income of 41,000 and deferral combined income of 50. When's the last time those numbers changed as far as the combined income is concerned? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, we adjust the eligibility criteria for those programs annually based on a cost of living increase. So council approves those programs, the income threshold level annually based on an annual bump. And how many people take advantage of those? Do you have any idea? We have approximately 6,500 low-income seniors, low-income disabled residents that take advantage of those two programs combined. So one is, um, what's the breakdown between seniors and low-income disabled? Do you know? The, yes, it's 95% seniors okay. are the people that are applying, 5% disabled, low income disabled. And now with the um, proposed levy for the city building fund, will that be rolled into the cancellation or deferral, that amount? Will that be covered? Yes, the, the deferral or the cancellation amount is based on total taxes. So yes, it is total taxes, including uh, the city building fund addition. And have we ever looked, and besides asking at 2%, have we ever done a, I want to call it a market analysis, or through the seniors forum or anywhere else, looked if that's actually the right number or suitable number, given what's happening uh, in the economy? Uh, yes, in fact, Councillor, we do that on an annual basis. We actually compare against other municipalities, other municipalities in Ontario and elsewhere. Um, we, we look for income levels and we look to Stats Canada to confirm what is a low income level. So that is an annual exercise that we do. And Toronto's relief levels are consistently higher than other Ontario municipalities in terms of uh, eligibility criteria. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. And I, I just wanted to follow up where Councillor Fletcher sort of left off. Um, as, as staff are aware, we brought a motion to Council in December um, 2019 uh, where we were looking at various amendments to improve the uh, tax relief programs. We were looking for a report back, I guess, in the first quarter of 2020, which we were still in. When, when will we see that report, and uh, what committee will it go to? Through you, Madam Speaker, that report is uh, on the agenda for the March General Government and Licensing Committee on, on the motion uh, to expand the eligibility criteria. Right. So last time this uh, briefly came before council as a member's motion, uh, there seemed to be an on the council floor dispute over what a primary residence was and how it relates to the Income Tax Act. And there was a lack of clarity on, on those rules. Will we have clarity at committee? Yes, we are seeking to clarify uh, and, and, and the the Eligibility criteria stems from the definitions and the provisions of uh, the City of Toronto uh, Municipal Code. And so if we are changing that eligibility, we will be looking to clarify some of the definitions to, to identify exactly who is, uh, who is included in the calculation of household income. So, so we have to look at issues such as on title, who's on title, who's living there, who's not living there. Those, so, those detailed legal issues in order to make this work. Correct. We had identified an owner as anyone who was on title. 
but we do have situations where owners who are on title are not resident at the premises. That's what we're looking to clarify. Right. And it became a debate over whether someone could actually be on title to multiple homes and declare those multiple homes as principal residence, which I, I think is kind of absurd under the Income Tax Act, but I'm not an accountant. So I'll leave that. That will be clarified at. We are steering clear of defining a principal residence. We are defining the residence. Um, uh, we're asking for disclosure from all owners on title, whether they reside at the premises or not. Right. Okay, a uh, second part of that, um, an amendment to the member's motion was moved uh, by um, uh, Councillor Perusa. And we were going, we were asking for the increasing the current maximum household income thresholds and establish eligibility. Will that also uh, be attached to the staff report? Yes, we are reporting on those and, and providing a range of options. Should we increase our eligibility threshold level? what that means in terms of cost implications, what it means in terms of eligible applicants. Now, generally speaking, though, this is a, a pretty small program with, I believe you just said, there's 6,500 eligible applicants under the current rules. I believe uh, the cost of the city is under a million dollars. I, I, that's what we had heard last time. 4.5 million. Sorry, 4.5 million. Okay, so it's a little more than I thought. Uh, but this, this actually helps thousands of... Uh, of low-income seniors and those on disability to, to stay in their stay in their homes. That is the intent of the program, yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. I look forward to your report. Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I guess this would be to the CFO or the city manager. The 1% city building fund increase that we see in this year's budget, how much capital Space in our capital budget does that free up annually? What would that equate to in the amount of uh, of capital spend that we could take out? Through you, Madam Chair, the uh, city building levy increase, in actual fact, will allow us to raise six point six billion. Six point six billion, but that's over the course of how, of how many years? Over the ten year capital plan. But that's the one percent annually that get us to that point. Not one percent a year. One and a half. One, sorry, not one and a half percent a year. That's the entirety of the city building fund ask currently. That's correct. Frees up six billion. Okay. Um, did did it make any space within the operating budget? Did we were we able to shift anything within the operating budget away from capital from current or anything that would free up space in the operating budget or no? Uh, not as a res through you, Madam Chair, not as a result of the city building levy. Um, when we get into the capital budget, as you may recall through budget committee, we discussed the fact that we've recast the capital plan, but that's not for this. Sure. Thank you. How important is it to increase the amount of revenue we come we have coming in in order to achieve the capital commitments that the city has set out? Through you, Madam Chair. Um, because we, in actual fact, are required to have a balanced budget, we are required to raise sufficient money to pay for the commitments or the spending that, or the investments that we're making. But on the capital side, and I'll ask the um, staff to put up the overhead here, the unfunded capital, from this is from our, our, our long-term financial plan, the unfunded commitment is in the order of $30 billion, correct? you, Madam Chair, that's correct. So this 1% will give us $6 billion over the, that 10-year horizon, correct? correct? So it'll it'll help us achieve some of those. Correct. Do, do you know if, if all of what we will be spending or, or have committed the existing, what we have of this $6 billion, if all of that was included in this 2018 chart by off the top of your head, or, or was any of it new? Through you, Madam Chair, in actual fact, the 2019 capital plan now reflects the new arrangement we have with the provincial government, which allowed us to take other monies that were dedicated towards expansion and now invest them in the state of good repair TTC backlog. But did that also include the all, does this, did this chart include all the vehicle purchases? No. So in fact, this chart would have a greater unfunded portion had we not had, uh, uh, had that new arrangement with the province made. Correct? That, that is correct. Yeah. So 
So the city building fund and the changes with the province, while the unfunded line would be increasing, we'd be able to fill in a little bit, like a fraction. Not quite all, but let's call it under a third. Six tenths. No, not six tenths, sorry. I'm trying to do the math in my head. It's like two, like, like a fifth, roughly. I'm seeing a head nod from the city manager. It's roughly a fifth, six billion and 30 billion. Remind me what other revenue sources the city or, or, or revenue tools the city has under the City of Toronto Act. Could you just r run them off for us? Through you, Madam Chair, uh, we currently engage uh, the MLTT, the Municipal Land Transfer Tax. Um, and in addition to that, we do have other revenue tools that we could consider. Um, one of them would be the uh, parking levy, one of them would be um, a vehicle license tax, as well as a vacancy home tax. So those are a few of the, of the revenue tools that were noted in our uh, VBOR that e y had done earlier th last year. For Thank you. And just one last question, because it came up at our budget town hall and I didn't have the answer. Does the, the vacant residential tax, does the same power hold for commercial property, vacant commercial properties, that we can in fact put a fee on properties, commercial properties that are held vacant? Uh, Councillor, that's a great question. Okay. I can't, uh, we're in I honestly couldn't, couldn't answer either, so I'll, we'll get that. It's a great question. Time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Councillor Fillion. Uh, thank you. Just uh, following up from some of uh, Councillor Perk's questions, um, Transportation, I guess, first, just because it's the biggest number. Do we uh, know what our um, state of good repair backlog was 10 years ago? Uh, through the speaker, we do not have that information at hand. Councillor, sorry about that. Okay, but it's now 3.2 billion? Correct. And going up to 4 billion and just over uh, 4 billion by 2029. Um, so at what point does that just become uh, entirely unsustainable to keep increasing our uh, backlog? Well, I've, uh, some of the processes we're putting in place to try to manage that more effectively uh, in terms of the life cycle cost of the pavement and trying to get in and fix some of those roads in advance of when they become more um, expensive to do. We have uh, put in place an asset management program that uh, is in place to do that. We understand the quantity of our backlog and uh, in part that backlog has grown in numbers over the last couple of years because we have better information about it now. Uh, and so we are looking to optimize our investments to do better coordination and bundling of projects so that we could take advantage of getting more things done with uh, less dollars, uh, increase our delivery capacity, and then um, look at some new methods for increasing that delivery capacity so, as well. So can I remind councillors we're, we're on the tax rate? Please, sure, questions we're, to we're, the tax rate? Yes, but we're looking at you, how, yeah. how bad so is our please revenue please keep it to problem. the tax rate. So, um, uh, and that, you, are you assuming all of those things in your projection of the state of good repair increasing to four billion? No, we are not. So, so it's based on current practice. Okay. So on, um, on the, just to follow up on something you said about when you delay uh, projects, it costs you more to fix them. Is that? Is that correct? It can, depending on the situation. If we can catch the pavement before the road needs to be reconstructed as opposed to resurface, the costs are typically quite a bit lower. Okay. So if we don't get the things in time, it costs us more money in the in Typically, the, in the it costs run. more, yeah. okay. Thank you. Then quickly, because uh, time is limited, um, question of the um, CFO. Um, would you know what our uh, state of good repair backlog was 10 years ago? And I apologize if I should have um, let you know I was going to ask that question. Three, Madam Chair. I'm, apologies, Councillor. I don't have that information okay. from 10 years ago. So it's, it's currently $6.5 billion going up to $8.3 billion projected um, um, for 2029. <laughs> I think those were the, the answers to Councillor Perks' question. So... 
Um, at what point does this all, if it isn't already, at what point does this just become unsustainable and um, we need, need to do something to reduce it rather than let it increase? Through you, Madam Chair, I don't think we can actually say at what point it's unsustainable. The fact is, is that this year we have uh, done a significant amount of work about better understanding what our capital needs are and the timing of when the capital spends are going to be required, which is why when we get into the capital plan, we spoke about recasting, having a better understanding and using um, industry best practices about stage gating. And so that way we can better predict how much and when we need uh, to fund certain requirements. So I don't think we can answer at what point it becomes unsustainable. Right. So do we, um, do we have any realistic plan uh, to get that state of good repair under control, like something that would be a significant amount of, of money? So, uh, through you, Madam Chair, this year's budget, in actual fact, doubled, almost doubled the amount of investments we are making in the state of good repair backlog for the TTC. So we have made significant investments or plan to make significant investments in, in reducing that state of good repair backlog. Sure. In addition, we also are addressing the TCHC state of good repair backlog. Sure, the but the, the backlog is increasing. If we had a if we had it on a chart, we'd see it's increasing and projecting to increase further. So I'm guessing, I, what I'm asking is, do we have any concrete plans to get that trend line going the other way? That was your last question. Through you, Madam Chair, we in actual fact, through this year's budget, do feel that we have uh, impacted that trend. Uh, I didn't have the information that you asked around about 10 years ago, but we have actually brought down the state of good repair backlog from prior year's projections. Thank you. Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you very much. On the uh, tax rate, please. Yes, of course. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Madam um, Speaker. Uh, to the CFO, um, the rate that we actually have in front of us um, where does that stack up with respect to CPI and the rate of inflation? My apologies, Councillor. Can you please repeat that? Sure. I wanted to understand the rate that's actually in front of us because it's my understanding it's normally consistent with respect to inflation or CPI. Is that consistent with respect to that particular policy and philosophy that we have uh, regarding the rate increases? Through you, Madam Chair, that is correct. It's 2%. Okay, and how do we stack up with respect to uh, comparing sort of the property taxes as a percentage of household, for example, within the region and maybe just by extension beyond? How does the city, where does the city of Toronto position itself? How do we stack up? Through you, Madam Chair, if we're, com if we're looking at uh, property taxes as a percent of households and we've done a jurisdictional scan, right. we actually are somewhere right in the middle of uh, neighboring jurisdictions in, up to including Ottawa. Right, so um, the property tax increase rate um, is something that all municipalities have in terms of raising fund, correct? That's right. correct. So, but Toronto has some other elements in terms of raising revenues, and I know through the questions that were asked by Councillor Layton, you answered those things. Um, and I, I hear just by some of the questions that are being asked, I guess some people are of the view that we should add additional taxes and so on. But we also have the municipal licensing, the, 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 the MTT, MLTT, right, correct? That's correct. And how does that work for us? I mean, is that something that is consistent across other municipalities in Ontario, or is it something that's unique to us? Uh, through, the, through you, Madam Chair, MLTT is, in actual fact, an additional tax that right. Toronto... Uh, homeowners incur when they in acquire a property. Right. And so when you look at sort of taxes and rates and so on, you have to look at it in its entirety. Would that be correct? That would be correct. Okay. Those are all my questions, Madam Speaker. Oh, I'm sorry. One other thing I wanted. Can you help me to understand, because I've been looking at the chart with respect to the city building funds. Um, at the start, which was some time ago, it was a 0.5 percent was that the number 
Through you, Madam Chair, yes, it was anticipated that it would be half a percent for six years, and right. we've increased it to one and a half. It's one and a half percent. That's correct. All right, now the one and a half, it, so you're adding one to this year's because we had 0.5 before? That's correct. That reflects then, the, and then thereafter it's 1.5? That's every correct. Year's, every year for up till 2025? That's that correct. correct. Okay, so then the cumulative total is 10.5? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Carroll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I have tax-related questions, Madam well, Speaker. thank you. <laughs> um, it's about the supplementary report, about the capping and threshold. Um, uh, I'm not sure who's answering this question, but there's there are comments at the end about uh, uh, if the education rate should change, that, that we're contemplating a report's coming to executive or perhaps a special meeting of council. Do we, do we have sort of a forecastable idea that it is changing this year and, and that we're gonna see, we're gonna see something that requires a special meeting of council? Through you, Madam Chair. Councillor, can you, rep sorry, we're a bit confused as to what rate you're referencing. Well, it, well it's, it talks about school rates, but I'm assuming that means the education portion. It's in the comments yes. of the supplementary report. Sorry, through, through you, Madam Speaker. The education rates, I'm right behind you, the education rates have, in fact, been established in draft. We are awaiting the regulation. Oh, so you do know that it's coming uh, this year. Yes. Um, well, I'm, I'm wondering if we need to dovetail that with starting to look at strategy. We will also, this year, receive the next uh, uh, CBA assessment. And I'm assuming for a four-year period, do we know that, that they're going to follow that same strategy? Uh, yes, we, yes, the uh, 2021 is the first year of the new reassessment cycle that will go for the next four years. So we are expecting to receive results of the new reassessments um, in the middle of 2020 this year. Okay, so I'm wondering if there is a, is there a proactive policy uh, strategy around that? Uh, I think, I think uh, well, it was just sort of presented to us, the, the threshold program that makes sure that through, you know, rounding by threshold, uh, commercial and industrial, a few more are paying their actual CVA assessed uh, 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 value rates. And there's somewhat of a protection, uh, only a tiny amount more in multi-res. So it, using that threshold, we seem to have, have been able to somewhat protect them, collect a little more, and collect a lot more from, from commercial that way, all of which is good for, for pure residential. I'm wondering if we have a new assessment coming and an update of the education rate, do we, do, does council need to ask that there be some sort of proactive uh, uh, committee exercise, policy exercise, to look at potential strategies for what could be a pretty devastating new CVA assessment. Uh, a, a huge amount happened in the real estate market. Or, or are you confident that they're, that MPAC will use their own caps such that, that uh, they'll mitigate the impact before it reaches us? Um, uh, again, through you, Madam Speaker, uh, we are expecting that there will be shifts and possibly dramatic shifts in assessment values. We've had early indications from MPAC. We've asked them to quantify the shifts so that we know when and where they're going to hit um, w in terms of City of Toronto. Um, we are proactively consulting with MPAC uh, on mitigation methods. We're consulting with the Ministry of Finance group and with stakeholder groups to identify apart from the caps that we've proposed in this year's report, are there other method, methods that we can use to mitigate uh, potentially devastating uh, assessment value increases and related tax increases? Okay, so it sounds like a whole lot of proactive work is going on on the staff side. And so when, would we, when can we expect a report would reach councillors through executive or whatever? We will actually be reporting to March uh, General Government and Licensing Committee on our early uh, observations, our, our early identification of tax policy options, and we will be following that up with industry consultations 
uh, over the course of 2020, but, but likely in Q2 or Q3 of 2020, we expect to be reporting back on, on results and options. Okay, and then last question. If the strategy taken under this new government is one that, uh, that we feel is going to hurt the city, will that report be in time for us to register our objections and, and have the province actually hear them and do something about them? Last question. It will depend on when we get quantitative good uh, data from impact on actual impact. So far, we've only had high level impacts at the class level. We need detailed uh, property by property so we know where the impacts are going to hit and we need to evaluate that against our current tax mitigation measures to see whether we need additional measures. So if we know that by mid 2020, yes, that gives us an opportunity to request the province uh, for legislative or regulatory change before the end of the year that would be in place for 2021. Thank yes. you. Thank you, you Councillor Crawford. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, questions for the uh, CFO. Um, and it just, you're just uh, repeating, I think, some of the answers that you mentioned. But in this 10-year plan, we are increasing our state of good repair, correct? Through you, Madam Chair, that's correct. And, and by how much again? Oh, through the city building levy that we're enabled to uh, decrease the state of good repair by $6.6 .6 billion. Okay. And with regard to our, our capital spend rate, we've had challenges in years past where, on average, our capital spend rate is citywide is in around 60%. Is that a correct statement? Through you, Madam Chair, that's correct. Okay. So what that means is we're, we're budgeting the money uh, for work that needs to get done, but we just can't spend it in, a, in an entire year. For you, Madam Chair, it would be either that we can't spend it or that the budgets have to be updated and the amounts that are being budgeted per project are changing as well. Okay, and, and can you, uh, again, talk about a bit about the, the recasting of the capital plan, what you, the work that you've been doing over the last year and continuing into the future about recasting that so we'll actually be able to spend more money um, of, of the capital plan that we budget. Can you talk a bit about that recasting? Through you, Madam Chair. So when we when we talk about recasting the capital plan, what it is is about revisiting the assumptions that were built into the capital plan in prior years and looking at those assumptions to determine, one, whether or not they were achievable and affordable. Introducing industry best practices that involve stage gating. Some of the uh, organization was, was implementing that but it wasn't consistent. And because of that, we now are more comfortable and more confident into the assumptions that are built in to better understanding the timing of a project and the amount that it is in the project. So when you're looking at state of good repair, when we're looking at projects that we want to do, um, you're going to be able to do more in state of good repair without necessarily raising the tax rates. Is that correct? Through, the, through you, Madam Chair, we're, conf, we're confident that with the increased city building levy that we are able to impact the state of good repair backlog. Okay, thank you. Councillor Cole on the tax rate. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. I just wanted to ask uh, staff uh, about uh, this whole issue of uh, the education uh, rate. Uh, and uh, and so what I'd like to, what I'd like, yes, very much so. So the, what is the education rate? What does it, that mean to an ordinary person living on Gloucester Grove in Toronto? Uh, to you, Madam Speaker, the education rate is applied to the property assessment the same way, way the municipal rate is applied. And we receive the educational rates by the province. So just a little louder, if the okay. mic. I, could you repeat that, please? So they the I, I, uh, the educational rates are set by the province and are applied to the property assessment the same way the municipal rates are applied. So the education rate, which the homeowner pays and businesses in Toronto pay and industries in Toronto pay, are set by the province of Ontario. Is that correct? That's correct. So when a person on Gloucester Grove gets their residential tax bill, how much of that tax bill 
is uh, the result of the education rate set by the province, approximately in percentage? Uh, for the residential, it's about one third for education. And for the commercial, it's almost half. So therefore, one third of the taxes on that bill for a residence is, is education, then half for a business, big and small, is uh, for education that they pay. Now, I know one of the complaints uh, that Tabia has made to me is that we have in Toronto, our small businesses pay the highest education tax rate in the province. Is that correct? Uh, that is correct. So what is the, uh, so therefore, if we were to compare what a business in Toronto on Eglinton Avenue pays for education taxes compared to someone in Streetsville on a street in Streetsville, Mississauga Road or whatever. So ours, our small business person would be paying more for education than would be a small business in Mississauga. Well, the actual taxes that businesses pay for education depend on the assessment and the rate. So if we have higher assessment, then maybe the result would be... So it's a combination. It's obviously if assessments go higher, uh, the tax uh, is going to be higher. But so it's a combination of the rate. But on the rate itself, is there an explanation why an education uh, tax paid by people in Toronto is, needs to be higher than what they pay for education in Mississauga? I don't have the answer for that. So I, I guess we don't have, I guess the province would uh, have an answer for us. Would they be getting more education in Toronto because they pay more? Or do we have any idea of that, what we get for our education taxes that we pay? Uh, education taxes are understood to cover only portion of the cost for education. Yeah, and that's a bit of a difficult question. The other thing I was, <laughs> I was intrigued by the comment about dramatic shifts coming in assessment. By, by shift, don't we mean that we're going to see a dramatic increase in assessments rather than, let's say, shifts? Is the shift one way and is that one way upward that we have to look forward to? Even if the assessment increases substantially, the tax impact is not, um, it's not affected because we then reduce the tax rates in order to have a revenue neutral. Yeah, so the pie is the same, so you're just adjusting uh, the, the rate. But on the other hand, but the assessment shifts we're talking about, can you explain what this assessment shift is? Some properties appreciate higher than others, and those that appreciate above the average for the city are experiencing a tax increase impact. So we're going to see, I guess, a dramatic increase in assessment on our main streets like Wellington, King Street. Is that what we're already seeing signs of? That was your last question. Some will increase more than others. OK. Th thank you. Thank you. Councillor Peruzza, on the tax rate. Uh, yes, ma'am. Um, I just want to turn our minds um, uh, for for a brief uh, moment on the on this on a policy decision that we made some years back uh, that speaks to uh, uh, the the differences between our residential tax rates and our commercial um, industrial rates. Uh, so some years back, uh, we made a conscious decision when, uh, when, the, when the differences were somewhere uh, be, you know, uh, between four and five yeah, Councillor Peruzza, yeah. to the speaker. Like you've got your back against the mic. We can hear you, and we really want to hear you. I, 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 I apologize for that speaker. Um, through the speaker, obviously, uh, to staff. Um, so, so what's been happening to that? Uh, through you, Madam Speaker, um, 
Toronto has consistently reduced the tax ratios within commercial and industrial uh, since 2006 through Council's approved policy to systematically ratchet down the tax rates within commercial, industrial and multi-residential classes based on targets that Toronto has set. Right, so, so I'm looking at a chart here. Uh, I'm sorry, I should have done that uh, sooner. I'm looking at a chart here that you produced uh, that say that in 2006, the, the differences between the residential uh, rate of tax or class and the commercial industrial, the difference was uh, that, that, that commercial industrial was at four and a half, uh, f a little over four times the rate of residential. Is that in fact correct? For industrial, yes, that is correct, and about 3.7 for commercial. So in 2006, we as a council made a very deliberate decision uh, uh, to, to decrease that ratio, uh, uh, that differential between residential and industrial commercial. Could you remind me on why we did that? Because it was generally assumed that the higher commercial tax rates in Toronto were, were causing businesses to locate elsewhere because of the high tax burden on commercial and industrial council uh, to improve Toronto's competitiveness, adopted target ratios to reduce the ratio within commercial and industrial to two and a half times with a target of 2020. So we hope to reach that target by 2020. We're now on track to reach that target by 2023. All right, but so, so we basically picked a number and said, you know what, we're, we're not, we, we don't think we're competitive here, we're bleeding uh, jobs to the 905, so therefore, we believe that we should lower the ratio between commercial, industrial, and residential to two and a half times. But that was a number we came up with. It's not, it's not, a, it's, it's not something that's uh, uh, etched in stone, correct? It, it was a policy decision. It wasn't a provincially mandated number. It was a number selected by council as a target, yes. Okay. And given the rationale for us doing that back in 2006, uh, have we achieved those objectives? Are we continuing to bleed jobs to the 905? Has that ratio uh, been reduced uh, uh, to the point where uh, we, we, we met all those objectives? Certainly, we have reduced the commercial tax ratios and tax rates um, within commercial and industrial class. Uh, whether we have stemmed the flow of businesses or changed uh, business location decisions, um, I would ask uh, economic development to comment on that one. Well, let me ask you the question another way. Has the big commercial industrial sector, have they been doing okay in terms of A, their, their taxes, and B, their sort of call it their net wealth or their, their cumulative wealth in terms of assessment growth. Have they been doing okay? They have certainly benefited from reduced taxes that they pay to operate businesses in Toronto, yes. So if we revisited that number and said, you know what, two and a half times was a noble objective, but maybe it should be three or three and a half times, uh, and we, they'd still be doing okay, uh, could we do that? Um, right now, because of provincial legislation, we cannot increase tax ratios in commercial and industrial. We can only keep them the same or reduce them. Okay, that was your last question. Thank you. Councillor Wong Tam on the tax rate. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'm gonna speak about, uh, I'm sorry, I'm gonna ask questions uh, regarding uh, foregone revenues uh, and related to the vehicle registration tax. Um, the provincial vehicle registration taxes is $120 a year, is that not correct? When it's time to renew the permit? Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair, that's correct. And the, the City of Toronto's vehicle registration tax when terminated in 2011, uh, what, was, uh, what was that quantum? Was it $60? Through you, Madam Chair, I have a range of, I think it was... Through you, Madam Chair, my colleagues say yes, it was 60. And, uh, and that would have generated about approximately $55 million a year for the city, is that correct? 61. Through you, Madam Chair, that's correct. And, 
And because it was terminated in 2011, uh, we have seen a foregone revenue of close to over 10 years, about $550 million. Uh, is that correct? To you, Madam Chair, if that tax had remained in effect, that's correct. And if we had an additional, if we had the initial $55 million in this particular budget, what would we be able to decrease our, our, our property tax by? Through you, Madam Chair, a 1% tax increase is worth approximately $30 million. So we could end up dropping the property tax rate by about a, a point and three quarters almost. Is that correct? Through you, Madam Chair, if you did a direct correlation, that would be approximately correct. Thank you very much. Okay, speakers. Councillor Perks. Thank you, Speaker. For a decade, we have got up at the beginning of our budget debates and had a disagreement about the property tax rate. Some on the floor of council have said we must hold it to the rate of inflation. Others have said, no, we need to go further for a couple of reasons, primarily though, to deliver the services that Torontonians want. In that decade, we have lost ground. We have fallen behind on maintaining a transit system that people can rely on. It is now a routine for Torontonians to expect that sometime in a given month, there's going to be some emergency in the morning that means they don't get to work. It's become routine for Torontonians to encounter people who are sleeping rough in the winter in Toronto and risking death. It's become routine for Torontonians to be unable to find affordable childcare. It's become routine for low and middle income Torontonians to be unable to find a place they can afford to rent. I could go on. You heard from staff in various departments that the cost of that decade of what I would call austerity budgeting has created a tremendous hole and risk in the future of Toronto. So as bad as the services that people experience are now, we've been told we can expect them to get worse. I'm delighted that this year we've finally broken out of that cycle of austerity budgets which are creating these problems in the City of Toronto. And Mr. Mayor, I want to congratulate you on having the courage and the foresight and the wisdom to bring in the City Building Levy. But there was always a second reason why we were in, wanted and needed to increase property taxes. And again, I'll remind you of a moment of courage that the Mayor showed. Last term, we proposed a road toll to pay for some of the very expensive transportation infrastructure projects that we have. The province of Ontario said no. And they said no because people around that cabinet table from neighboring municipalities said, why on earth would we give the city of Toronto a new revenue source when they're not using the one they have? Cabinet ministers who represented 905 areas looked at their property tax rules and said, our, our citizens pay far more in property tax than Torontonians do. Why would we give the city of Toronto a new revenue source? And that was always the second reason why we needed to increase our property taxes. That, it was to establish that we are willing to ask our citizens to pay more before we do what city managers and chief financial officers told us we needed to do every year from amalgamation until uh, we stopped doing long-term financial planning about 10 years ago. There was always a checklist. Get your own house in order, bring your property tax in line, and I will remind you on that checklist, CFO Joe Panichetti and CFO Cam Weldon would always put it on, get a sales tax. The mayor is absolutely right when he says you can't solve the childcare problem and all the transit problems and all the housing problems just on the back of the property tax. The problem is too big. And that's why when we did long-term financial planning, the City of Toronto and the financial staff from the City of Toronto always said we're going to need a new revenue source beyond what we have. Something like what you see in all major municipalities in North America and in Europe that get to our size. Once you have to operate a subway system, once your, your real estate values create a crisis in housing affordability, 
every other major municipality goes to income tax and or sales tax. The Chicago Transit Authority gets a piece of the sales tax. The city of New York, their education system and the city itself get a piece of the income tax. I think it's time for us to face facts that we're not going to be able to solve our housing crisis, our transit crisis, our childcare crisis, our state of good repair crisis. We're not going to be able to deliver the quality of life that Torontonians want by crossing our fingers that other orders of government will increase their taxes and just send us money. We're going to have to take the next step. And that's the lesson of this year's budget. Stepping out of the austerity budgeting for the last decade is a necessary first move. But the conversation over the next several years in Toronto has to turn to what every long-term financial plan this council ever considered said, thank, thank which you. is the sales tax. Thank you. Councillor Layton to speak. Yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Uh, I'd ask that staff, uh, if they could put up the overhead uh, just while I'm speaking, that'd be great. I just want to talk about two things very quickly. One that we need, we need to pass a budget with revenue sources that meet both our current needs and our future needs. I'm not gonna go back and look at the past because honestly, I believe that this council, this administration, this mayor, this budget chief, and many of us have turned a corner, have realized and have per perhaps taken to heart the advice of our previous city manager who through our long, the, the report, the Toronto's long-term financial plan, demonstrated that unless we started focusing on revenue, we were going to have serious problems, not only with the future projects that we all want to build, the transit, the housing, the rec re recreational infrastructure, but just keeping the lights on, just keeping the trains moving on time. That graphic, if you could put it back up, please, shows that Thank you very much. If you could put the uh, overhead back on. Um, demonstrates that just to meet and maintain existing service levels, we needed in the order of $900 million. The and this is from the, the previous city manager's report. It shows just the depth of the impact that our lack of revenue sources was doing to our city budget from 2018 and moving onward. If, we, if you just read the report, and this is an excerpt of it, the city continues to experience low growth in most of its revenue base. It does not have the sufficient revenue to meet its spending needs, neither under existing service levels and capital projects, nor to pay for councillors approved strategies and plans. That sounds like a piece of Councillor Perk's newsletter. That's our previous city manager, the gentleman who now has been tapped by the federal government to go and help them help manage their books. It goes on, in terms of financial planning, council spends relatively little time on the city's revenue strategy compared to its service level deliveries. It is critical that city's revenue and, expend and expenditure strategies are effectively integrated. This includes matching the timing of revenues to expenditures, which is I think something that our, our, our new CFO has actually tried to manage quite well in the new budget as we shift over uh, to, uh, to, to budgeting off the previous years and the capital budget to actually reflect what we can deliver. But we all know that even our existing city's needs aren't enough. We don't want to just be remembered as those status quo councillors. I certainly know that our mayor doesn't, but I know that many of you don't. We don't want to be known as those councillors that sat back and watched a homelessness crisis, a housing crisis, an environmental crisis, go by and, 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 and our council didn't make the necessary investments to address them. And that's why I asked some of those questions about what tools could we use. The 1.5% the 1 is a great first, first start to help us start to turn that corner. But that's not going to fill in that $30 billion hole. It's not all going to be done on property taxes. We need to look at these other tools. We need to look at the tools we have access to, 
the vehicle registration fee, a parking levy, vacant property tax, a vacant, a vacant property tax. And we also need to look at tools that we can fight for, like a sales tax. Do you know, if we got the 2% back that Harper, that Harper gave away on the, on the HST, if we got that 2% back as a city, that'd be a billion dollars a year. Councillor McKelvey could have a, tr a, a new subway station in, in Scarborough every year, and Councillor Bailao could have thousands of new units of affordable housing every year. A billion, I don't think that's a priority at this stage, but that's fine. You can have your own priorities. I was focusing on Councillor McKelvey's. Um, there, there is a need for us to have a robust tool like that if we're gonna actually make a dent in that $30 billion. So I'd like to congratulate the mayor and the budget chief and many on council who are starting to, to, to see the value in, sift, in, in shifting that, that, that ship and in fact putting their political capital on the line uh, to do so. Now we just need to make that next step forward. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Board. Thank you uh, very much, Madam Speaker, and uh, to my previous colleagues' comments, I don't know if I'm necessarily turned that corner yet, but I guess that's what I'm uh, speaking to right now. Um, so first off, uh, without a doubt, I think just like all my colleagues have shared, uh, uh, my uh, personal thanks to, to the Mayor for um, this budget process, it takes a lot of work, and of course the budget chief uh, and the budget committee, and as well as our uh, exemplary uh, city staff who do a great job uh, every day. Uh, thank you for all your work on this. Um, I'm going to keep my uh, comments brief on this item. I think I'm a little more to say on the next item. Um, but with this particular, uh, I, I do want you, a lot of reference has been given to our Auditor General uh, throughout this uh, budget process. Um, and uh, that being uh, the work that she has done, being a big part of where uh, this budget has landed today. Um, so I also want to uh, uh, thank her for the work that she has done. Um, but what, what this comes down to for me, uh, which I have said before in December, um, being opposed to um, the city building levy, um, which I believe is a significant cost uh, to the residents of Toronto when uh, everything is adding up. Um, so uh, it will uh, be hard for me. I kind of worked with our city clerks to see if I could separate it and support uh, the rest of it, but it's too much baked in. Um, uh, so for uh, a number of reasons, which I shared in December why I didn't support it, I won't reiterate it here, uh, but I won't be uh, supporting that. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Councillor Holliday to speak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I would want to thank Councillors Perks and Layton for inspiring me to speak just briefly. Um, the Councillor said some correct things. <laughs> they, they were correct in what they said, that we had been warned by previous city managers about the ability to fund all of the things that Council has asked to do, <coughs> specifically with the tools that we've got, which is the, the property tax base. But what they left out of the, out of the statement was the other side of the equation is that city managers have reminded us that council has to exercise caution in the endeavors that we go down. We make decisions in this chamber without a plan on funding. I think back to the value-based outcomes report, and there was a very important line in there that talked about our approach to the transfer of wealth within this city and the way that we do that through the programs that we have. And the cautionary tale was is that appropriate to link up to the property tax base? And I think the question that we have to have in, in the work that we do here, in how we interact with citizens, is to always bring us back to the question of what it is that we are here and supposed to do. And I appreciate the politics of how it unfolds in this chamber. We head down the path of many, many equity-seeking programs. That is to take money from one group of citizens to move it to another through a vehicle or a process. And you always have to ask the question, is this the right place to do that? Does that belong to another order of government? And sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes the answer is no. Maybe it's better suited at the federal level or at the provincial level because they have progressive income taxes and 
That's their job. That's what they're elected to do, and that's the programs that they have to move money from one group of people to the other. I think back to the type of concerns that people call my office about, and they say, you know, counselor, our services are deteriorating. We're getting less. The grass is being cut less times. The roads aren't kept up like they used to be. And you know, that VBOR report was right. It said that we haven't been raising taxes at the same rate um, that we could or should to keep those programs up. Instead, that money has gone towards other programs that this council has deemed a priority. And one has to ask that question as, should we be in those businesses or should we just be turning on the federal and provincial governments to say, hey, that's your job. We have an opinion on these matters, but you should step up to the plate. But no, we choose to supplement it. So I, um, I did express concerns about the tax levy and taxes overall, and uh, I will be voting accordingly. But it's not because I'm opposed to just any tax increase or don't think we should grow or don't think we should serve our citizens. That's incorrect. The concern I have is we tend to spread ourselves too widely and we get into things that really don't belong at the municipal level. And I understand people want to try to help and help other people. But you always have to ask, is this the right place to run that program? And are uh, property taxpayers the right people through that tool to ask to pay for it? Is that fair? And I think if you look at those carefully, you reach the conclusion that in some places, in some cases, it's not the right way. And that's not just me saying that. It's the many people that I've talked to that have expressed the same concerns. So I'll ask, and I hope councillors will give consideration to that as we think about different property tax increases over time. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak. Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Speaker. I think it's very important to know that when um, councillors debate the tax rate, and, and ask for more and more taxes. They've got to realize that Torontonians are already paying their fair share through other revenue tools. They've got to realize that we are the only municipality with a land transfer tax. We have the municipal accommodation tax. We have the billboard tax. Now, when we tried tolls, we, I got zero emails from other uh, residents of other municipalities saying, when you raise your taxes, that's when we'll talk about tolls. That's not the way they were saying. They simply did not want to give Toronto a revenue tool, even though those were dedicated to regional transit. People have talked a lot about a, a sales tax, a sales tax in Toronto. Well, that will not work. Former uh, Finance Minister Jim Flaherty said that it has to be a regional tax, or you will kill the retail in this city. If you have an extra retail sales tax on, on Toronto-based retail outlets, people are going to flood across municipal boundaries to shop. So what you need is you actually need a, a multi-municipal agreement, that there be a regional sales tax shared among the regions for regional goals such as, um, uh, such as uh, transit. So let's go back to the vehicle registration tax. So this council, uh, there were 14 new councillors at the time. Uh, some are still here. Uh, almost 10 years ago, this council voted down the regional, the, the vehicle registration tax. Now, with all due respect to my colleague here, uh, it was a tax that many people misunderstood. People misunderstood where the money was going. They misunderstood how it was being implemented. They had to pay it on their licensing renewal date, which in most cases was someone's birthday, the last thing you want to do uh, on your birthday. So people will buy into a revenue tool if it's explained where the money goes, if it's dedicated, and if it's going to be used for the social good. I mean, if you look at many fundraising campaigns from, from institutions such as post-secondary uh, universities or uh, hospitals, when you dedicated the source of those fundraising tools to something very specific, such as a prenatal wing or, or cancer equipment, they raise much more funds if they just than when they say, oh, it's just going into uh, general revenue. Touched on very briefly by Councillor Holliday is the fact that our wider problem is this municipality is taking on way too much. We're taking on the same responsibilities as a national government and a provincial government with a lack of ability to pay for those services. It's been a dump down for, for over a decade. So what are we looking at? We have an aging population in which we have seniors on fixed incomes unable to stay in their principal residences. And our, our, the, the City of Toronto policy 
is aging in place is the key. Having people, having seniors stay in their, in their principal residence as long as they can until they need long-term care. And that is why we have a motion coming to, I believe, Executive Committee uh, next month where we are revising and reforming the tax relief policies to make sure more and more seniors can stay in their home and get the relief they need uh, from tax increases. And at the same time, there's also a provision here to review and, and expand the caps on income so that more and more people can get the relief they need to stay in their homes. The last thing we want to do in this council chamber is make it a more expensive city, push people out of their homes, and make it unlivable. We've got to make sure that we strike a balance between the funds we need to run a city and deliver the services that people expect, but at the same time, um, make sure that we don't uh, harm the very people who built this city, the seniors, the war veterans, and so forth. So what we're looking at, we have to provide the relief we need to, the, to our aging population, but at the same time, we have to look very closely at any revenue tools to discuss and make sure we don't harm the people we're trying to help. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Cole. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, I, th I think uh, the uh, uh, operative uh, sort of uh, debate here is uh, how do we get the money to pay for these necessary services, not hurt people uh, as we uh, raise taxes? And uh, that is a uh, very, very complex, and, uh, and it's a very difficult uh, problem to resolve. Uh, I know that uh, the mayor and his courage in uh, bringing about more revenues for housing and transit uh, is something that the uh, majority of people, certainly my constituents, have appreciated. They may argue about uh, their taxes being too high and their tax bill, but they do appreciate that there's going to be investment in affordable housing and the city's investing in better transit. That has been universally accepted as something we had to do. Not necessarily wanted to do, but it's a necessary uh, initiative on behalf of this council and the mayor. So that's been uh, widely accepted as something very, very positive. And that's uh, quite different than the way things used to be whenever you would uh, propose such a, a levy or a special source of revenue. Uh, I just want to say that the other thing that uh, is perplexing is looking for revenue tools. Uh, the problem I have with revenue tools, most of them are regressive. In other words, they don't account have any accountability for a person's income. They're right across the board. Like, you know, the uh, license uh, fee of $60. It didn't matter if you're driving a uh, Cadillac or driving uh, a, a Ford Ranger, you pay the same amount, uh, of that $60 fee. So there's a lot of people that, you know, it didn't phase them at all that they had to pay an extra fee because who knows what their income is. So that's the problem with most revenue tools the city has at its disposal. They pay no heed to a person's ability to pay. And that's why the best source of revenue always comes from federal provincial taxation, which is progressive. It's based on your ability to pay. And most people accept that for the most part. And so if you look, and then the thing we've got to emphasize again, I think Councillor Pasternak was talking about that, is this is already, besides the taxes that are paid, it's already a very expensive city to live in. We forget, you know, if you try to hire a handy person to fix up things around the house in Toronto, <laughs> see what they want to charge you per hour. You hire someone to fix your house and you're living in uh, Kenora, I'm sure they're not paying the same you know, hourly rate for a handy person here in Toronto. Or a mechanic. Try to get your car fixed in Toronto see what you get charged to, to get your front end uh, done in Toronto. And I'm sure if I went to Kirkland Lake, it would be a hell of a lot cheaper than getting my car fixed in Toronto. And you look at all the services, whether it be dry cleaning, whether it be child care, whether it rent. I've said this before. You can rent a house in uh, Pembroke for 600 bucks a month, a whole house. 
In Toronto, for 600 bucks a month, you can't even rent a garage. Almost. That's what it's getting to. So these are extra costs that people in Toronto pay that we have to take into account when we look at new revenue tools that we're going to add on to their daily cost of living. And so that's very significant. It's a cumulative effect of all those things together. And uh, I, I just want to say, you know, the uh, $60 fee, I remember when that was imposed, I remember talking to the agents at the Service Ontario, they felt their life was being threatened on a daily basis. So some of you who have we're in favor of that fee, and theoretically, I'd like to see people who drive cars pay more. But the reality is, when you put that $60 fee, you basically angered so many people. Like, in all my years, I've never pe seen people so angry over a new fee. That's 60 bucks. Day in and day out, people were saying, that's $60, and how can they do it? And these are also people who could afford it. So be very careful when you assume, well, it's just 60 bucks. People don't like extra fees that they feel are not, uh, let's say, compatible with their Thank, thank you, lifestyle. Councillor Cole. Thank you. Councillor Carroll. Thank you, Madam Speaker. I, I asked questions about next year when, when uh, we were asking questions of staff because I am very concerned. I'm comforted, though, a, a lot of proactive work is already going on, and, and we're getting ready for that. But it's one of the reasons why uh, we do, like it or not, have to look at uh, uh, those ways of collecting revenue that, we're, that are available to us and those that are not that we should be asking for. We do have to look at them, because in, in terms of the property tax regime, we're about to uh, see some of our residents and some of our businesses be devastated by whatever is their assessment increase and yet for us because of the the capping system that they uh, impose it's not going to be a windfall for us they'll all end up thinking that it is but it won't be and so we'll be back in the same box that we've been uh, uh, struggling to get out of since amalgamation in 2000 since uh, uh, the advent of CBA but Madam Speaker uh, Councillor Holliday is right about one thing. We don't look at how we're going to fund things. We don't really do the deep dive in revenue. I find that when I talk about revenue tools, we understand very, very little about them. How many here know how a payroll tax works? 17 states have realized that, that sales tax are problematic and that you do hit seniors with them. But every employer, every employer in the GTHA has the software to do payroll deductions. And if you looked at a payroll tax, seniors don't pay it. ODSP recipients don't pay it. OW recipients don't pay it. And the businesses themselves don't pay it. But if they were collecting from residents, uh, councillors, uh, if, if I used sort of the average rate of those 17 states in the United States, uh, about $20 would come off your paycheck. $20. You wouldn't have, you went out and buy a washer and dryer on the weekend, you wouldn't have to pay a sales tax. So you wouldn't, wouldn't go through the roof, but $20 would come off your paycheck. And most of us give $40 to the United Way already to cover things that we're not able to cover in the budget that we need to cover them in. $20. Some of our senior team make more than us, they might pay $50. But if you, if you are taking home $35,000 a year and you can't afford to house yourself in the city of Toronto, you're going to pay 11. And if you're not working at all, if you're retired, you're going to pay zero. Did anybody know that that's how that works? Probably not, because we don't look at these things. We react to a report at the last minute and make dramatic speeches in this room, and then all agree to say no to anything. I said. No to road tolls, because it was going to cost my husband and I 40 bucks a week. $40 a week for the two of us to, to use the DVP to go to work at $2, which we didn't even know for sure was going to be the, the, the trip uh, cost until we got through the implementation. And it was going to cost about $300 million to implement and about uh, uh, $15 million a year to collect. So it made me nervous. We, we've got to find out what all of them do. 
and, and what the impacts are and are not with all of them. Because earlier uh, I heard uh, Councillor Perks posed a question and I think he posed it in a way that he wasn't quite clear and so we got an answer that wasn't quite accurate. We are not reducing our state of good repair backlog this year. It is getting more and more every year from here on in. It's great to have the levy, but we're going to spend it on things that were below the line. They are not Soger. Councillor Kelly used to call it Soger the Ogre. And in every division, there's a multi-year outlook, and the backlog's going up. So we're not going to get away with not looking at this, but next year, we're going to have an assessment that means we're not really going to be able to go to the property tax pool other than our CBF, our city building fund levy. So to address that bigger problem, Soger the Ogre, we aren't finished this conversation. And proactively we've got to have it, and then we have to all get on the same song sheet, having decided which one it is, and then we have to go get it no matter who's sitting in that government, whoever the government of the day is, and you're running out of time to get it. Because at three million people, we're the only city in the world trying to survive on property tax alone. Thank you. Councillor Crawford. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, you're right, we do have this conversation every year at this time. This is the first item that comes up. Uh, and we discuss it, we debate it, we make a decision, and we move on. And the decision that has happened over the last number of years is to keep the property tax rate that impacts the operating at the rate of inflation. And uh, we move on, we have the second conversation, uh, but the second conversation, which will happen after this, of course, is about how do we invest in the city. One of the things we have been doing, and we've been doing year after year after year, is attempting to keep property taxes as low as possible, but at the same time, investing in the city. Every budget, I think this year is probably the one budget year where, where we have invested more in this city. At the same time, keeping the property tax rate with regard to the operating uh, at the rate of inflation. Yes, we do have the city building fund this year and that of course helps with that. But I have taken the stance as, as the budget chief along with the mayor to start off looking at trying to keep property taxes as low as possible. That's the first thing I do. I will not and do not want to increase property taxes unless I am confident and comfortable that we are managing our own behind the scenes. And we have been doing that year after year after year. The investments continue to increase and we are still keeping the property tax rate, I think at a reasonable rate, this year is a bit more recognizably. When you're looking at, and just this year, doubling the state of good repair for the TTC. Look at that Toronto community housing. For the first time, we are now putting the money into that corporation to write itself, to be able to put the money in that with funds, of course, from the federal government. But we're doing that, and we are doing that at the same time, keeping our property tax rate at a reasonable level. We are increasing our state of good repair. Every year we do a 10-year capital plan. We readjust, we look at the priorities, and we continue to do more. When you're looking at our capital plan, we're, re we're recasting our capital plan, giving us the ability to do more with the capital plan without more dollars. And we need to continue to do that to try to figure out how we do things. And I've had the, uh, the pleasure of going down to New York with my colleague uh, to, on a TV show to talk about sales tax, to talk about other revenue tools. And you know what? It was enlightening to me. It enlightened in the sense that, you know, we do need to have that conversation. I have supported in the past modest revenue tools. And do we need to go down that direction of a sales tax? I'm not sure. But I can tell you one thing, it's not happening here. We can have the conversation, we can do whatever we want. It's until the province makes the decision to want to grant us that, we can do that. So in the meantime, I don't, from my perspective, not wasting that kind of time. I'm more interested in building the kind of city we need to build and trying to find the right kind of efficiencies, modernization within the budget that we have. And I'll give one good example. When you're talking about revenue tools and we're talking about um, rate of return, we just created an investment board, a uh, year and a half, two years old. We're not at the point where we can realize what that is going to do for us, but we have five billion dollars in, uh, in reserves. We, in the past, had only the ability to put it in very modest um, accounts to, to sort of look at our return. We went to the province, we asked, well, can we have a little bit of flexibility in that to be able to say, can we set up an own independent board to look at how we invest? And we've done that modestly. 
and I can tell you one thing, and we won't see the returns for a while, that is going to increase. When you're talking about revenue tools, that would be a revenue tool that I'm very supportive of because it's working within house to ensure that we can get the kind of revenues you want. So that's just one good example. Createo, that's another example. When you're looking at bringing all the real estate divisions together into one and the kind of money that that is going to save over many, many years, we don't know that yet, but I'm sure it's going to be a lot. Those are the kind of ways I look forward, I look to as my role as a budget chief to be able to figure out ways that we can find more money to be able to reinvest in the city. I don't necessarily think that we have to raise taxes uh, beyond the rate of inflation to do that. And in fact, when I, I, hear this, I hear this austerity budgeting that we have been doing over many, many years. Now, we have in the past done some austerity budgeting. I've been part of that. I can tell you one thing, the last three, four, five years, there's been no austerity budgeting happening here. In fact, we continue to invest more, invest more, and that's what we'll continue to do in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Fillion. Um, thank you. So I think when you count everything all in, not just the property tax uh, before us, but the city building fund and the reduction in the garbage rebate, we are certainly going to the uh, residential taxpayer for as much as we can. And so I, I think, um, you know, on balance, what what's before us is a, uh, um, you know, a very good uh, budget and uh, and I do want to thank the mayor uh, for his leadership and Councillor Crawford and and uh, the staff and all the others who put time into it. But um, while we're patting uh, on the back, we also need to not ignore the inconvenient truth that we just are not bringing in enough revenue from all sources to uh, cover our needs and. The state of good repair is really, um, you know, the municipal equivalent of a, of a deficit. We're not allowed to run a deficit, so we just keep putting expenditures off and off and at getting further into a hole in the same way you would with the deficit. And at, at some point, um, that's going to cause us a big problem, and we need to acknowledge that. Um, I had something happen for the first time uh, la late last year. I brought a large group of residents together just to talk about um, the future direction of the city. And there was about 40 people in the room. And one of the questions we asked was, who thinks the city needs more revenue? And typically in Willowdale, if I'd asked that question previously, I would have got you know, maybe a 2020 split. And uh, I was somewhat flabbergasted when all 40 people in the room unanimously said, the city needs more revenue, you need to get it from us one way or another. Uh, tried the same thing out on an, another group um, a month or two later, uh, didn't get as a didn't get 40 people, but got about uh, 30 people out of 40 saying you need to um, get more revenue from us and the other 10 sort of said and we'll give you more money when you're doing a better job with what we give you which is more the typical response that I had uh, previously. So I think you know the public is increasingly becoming aware that um, you know the city needs more revenue in order to create the kind of city we all want. And um, so while we're uh, patting ourselves on the back, we need to acknowledge that. And I don't want to say this is a good budget, but, you know, uh, I'd rather say this is a good budget and we, ought, we need to uh, acknowledge that we urgently need to find new revenue sources. And obviously those need to be ones which bring in a very large amount over a very broad um, segment of the population. So, you know, gas tax, sales tax, um, you know, those are kind of the obvious solutions and um, we need to uh, push for those and we need to push for those aggressively. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Councillor Peruzza.
Uh, thank, thank you, Speaker. I have a motion I'd, I'd like to, uh, to move. And it's basically uh, an information request. And it, it picks up on the questions I was asking earlier today. Um, in 2005, 2006, as a city council, me, we made a very conscious decision to, to align more closely the commercial industrial taxes of the City of Toronto to its residential uh, uh, taxes paid. So that was a conscious policy decision undertaken by this council in 2005-2006. Why did we do that? We did that, and I, and, I, and I forget the name of the, I had it here somewhere in the notes, what the, uh, what the uh, initiative was called. It was called, I'll tell you, Enhancing Toronto's Business Climate. So in order for us to enhance Toronto's business climate, we didn't want to bleed jobs to the 905 or to other areas or other jurisdictions. So we made a conscious, very conscious, deliberate policy decision to say, we are going to take industrial commercial taxes across the city of Toronto and bring them closer in line to the residential tax rate. And we set a target of two and a half percent, two and a half times. Somewhere at four, somewhere a little over three, somewhere a little higher. And we said, we want to bring that ratio down. So what did that do over that period of time? Well, it basically reduced the tax rates for commercial industrial across Toronto quite significantly. And who shouldered the burden? Who shouldered the loss in revenue? The residential. So residential, single family residential, essentially shouldered the burden and, and, and I agree with the multi-residential, that's fine. Shoulder the burden for us decreasing the rates on multi-residential and commercial industrial. So when you look at all of the property taxes paid in, in, in Toronto, uh, commercial industrial for us represents about, uh, out of the four and a half billion dollars, about one and a half uh, billion. Now, I had made some notes here. And... Uh, I can't find those notes, but I'll try to go on, on uh, what, what, where my thinking was earlier. Commercial industrial, especially the big commercial industry, have done very, very well. Not only have they done well by us in terms of our own po policy change, but they've done well through appeals. You all know this. We've lost, we've bled hundreds of millions of dollars to them through their, through their uh, you know, through their appeals. Why? Because, because it's very, very difficult to develop values, uh, market values, for big commercial industrial properties. There's no, there's no roadmap. So what these guys have done, they've taken us to the, uh, you know, to the, uh, uh, to the different uh, tribunals, and they've won very, very significant reduction in taxes. Why? Because of methodology changes in terms of their value. So they've been doing well in terms of our tax rate. They've done incredibly well in terms of their appeals. And we should be looking at revisiting those ratios we established. They won. We won this battle. We won it a long time ago. We are no longer bleeding jobs to the 905. So why we just keep pursuing that policy is beyond me. And Councillor Coley asked a very interesting question. 50% of the commercial industrial taxes go towards paying education all over the province of Ontario. So those monies are collected here, but they're distributed all over. So we need to revisit that, revisit the policy, because as our reliance becomes heavier and heavier on residential property taxes, we need to look at the commercial industrial uh, uh, sector and see how that's been doing. 
Thank you, Councillor Peruzza. So my motion asks for a report on us looking exactly at that Thank very you. question. Councillor Grimes has a question. Three minutes clarification. Yes. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Councillor Peruzza, um, would you believe just be the, just the taxes are not a problem for these these uh, industries? And, I, and I'll just take uh, Campbell Soup and I'll take uh, Christie Biscuits uh, craft that was done where we've built all around. There's other pressures on these businesses just besides the taxes and. You know, uh, Kraft said, look, you know what? You built all around me. My trucks can't even get into our facility now. Look at the price of our, our land. You know what, which, which happened? They sold it, and uh, it's being developed as residential. So there's, do you not, not see that there's other pressures besides the taxes we're putting yeah, uh, I, I, on these on these large employers? Yeah, Campbell I, Soup, I, Kraft, I, I, that are yeah. saying, you know what? I'm cashing in on our value of our, our property, and we're, we're going to the United States, and we're heading out to, uh, out to Whitby. It's just not the tax rate, what the pressures these, these companies are seeing? Uh, there's no question that industrial operations, especially industrial operations, uh, within a very dense urban, uh, um, uh, uh, urban environment become very, very difficult. Uh, uh, but industrial, uh, and while we want to protect and preserve industrial, represents only about 2% of the commercial industrial uh, tax class. It's very, very small, uh, and only a very small sliver has been left here in the city of Toronto. Uh, what we really have is we have First Canadian Place, and we have the Eaton Centre, we have Yorkdale, and we have these big commercial uh, retail places that, that, have done, that have been winning, winning, and winning some more. They've been winning with us, they've been winning with everybody. They've been, they've been winning all the way to the bank, and all I'm saying is, is hang on a second, as, as you win, win, and then win some more, maybe we can take back a little bit of that win and shift it to all of these other people who have been subsidizing those victories uh, for these folks. So while I, while I agree with you that, that industrial uh, and, uh, and, um, and heavy industrial in a very dense urban environment like Campbell Soup, for example, um, and like some plants in, in my area, uh, uh, both in the Duke Heights BIA and the Emory Village BIA, uh, uh, their, their operations are somewhat difficult. But the other thing that I ask to look at is okay, this. Proof we do that. something else very no, very, Councilor very important Prusa, speaker. Councillor Grimes is asking a yeah. question. Oh, Just, so, you so only have also, another 30 seconds. I saw Councillor Matlow and, and, and Councillor Cole going to bat for their residence up on, uh, on, on Eglinton. They're experiencing a tremendous amount of pressure. So we keep piling on these people, and I think some of these, uh, uh, these, these, these uh, commercial uh, tenants are struggling to stay even afloat at this point. So there's other hey, pressures. Councillor Grimes, please, clarification of yeah, the motion. So I'm just saying, you realize there's other pressures besides the tax rate that's happening to, to these businesses. That was your last uh, No, I, I, I do. And I also want to speak to another thing that we're doing very significantly with some of the businesses that you want to protect. So, so we have these uh, uh, two blocks of assessment for commercial industrial. We have this first block uh, up to about a million dollars, and then the rest is paid at a different rate. What we also need to do, and, and that's what this motion also asks to do, is to revisit that. Because while a million dollars to protect small businesses and smaller uh, uh, industrial operators. Uh, maybe a million dollar in 2005 or 2006 made sense, but maybe what we should be looking at now is, is expanding that block because, as you know, uh, uh, property values in the city of Toronto have increased exponentially, okay, not only for residential, Councilor but also Prusa. for commercial industrial no. uh, property, okay, property owners. So, Grimes, so maybe a million dollars doesn't questions. make sense in order to protect Councilor small Peruzza, businesses. thank you, thank you. No, you're done. You had three minutes. You're way over three minutes. Councillor Holliday, just clarification of the motion. Thank you, Madam We're not Speaker. going for speeches. I will try. I just wanted to be clear, Madam Speaker, through you to the mover, as to whether or not part number one talks about the property classes between uh, single-family residential and multi-res, because that's one of the other tax classes that are different. And is it the intention of this report to also examine that balance? Uh, no, it, it's very specific around commercial industrial because, as you as you will note, the multi-residential was at significantly higher, and that relationship has come uh, has come down somewhat, and is much closer now to to single residential. I believe the ratio there is somewhere around um, hmm, two eighteen two four six. Uh, 2.1, uh, where the where the commercial industrial now is around 2.6 and a half. 
uh, the, the multi-res is a 2.1. Oh. So it's still, so if you live in a rental unit, you're still paying uh, twice, uh, uh, twice as much in property tax as somebody who's living in a single family house. Okay, Councilor Holliday, your that, next question. There should be that difference. Councilor Thank Peruzza, you. please, one at a time, sure. questions. Is it your intent with this report to have a full economic analysis of a business climate? Because we know that it's not just the property tax, but it's the water rate, the electricity rate. I think Councilor Layton got through a motion to look at a special tax on parking lots, if I recall. Fee. It's a fee. Sorry, a fee and other fees and charges that we put towards businesses. Is it your intent to sort of bring all that into the mix or just look at the taxes in a vacuum? You know what? I think we look at that all the time, and, and Councillor Colin mentioned that. So while you have a lot of those add-ons, while they, you pile on to business, you're also piling on to people who live here. Uh, you know, their oh. mechanic costs more, their, their rent costs more, uh, you know, their, uh, um, I don't know, their daycare costs more, their transit costs more, their food costs what, more. Uh, you know, uh, your travel costs way, way more. You know, you got, uh, like, you can, you can park in most places up in Wawa for free. Here you got to pay yeah. parking everywhere. You know, so, I, I so didn't get an answer. <laughs> all of those things add up, Councillor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Let's just please, clarification of the motion only. Councillor Cole, do you have clarification? Yes, a very specific okay. clarification of a very good motion by my colleague here, Councillor Prutza. And just sort of continuing on to, to what Councillor Grimes was talking about, the concern is in this report, I don't see any reference to ensuring that we don't uh, put all business into one basket, that we also understand the small business uh, shopkeepers uh, on Main Street, uh, that we don't shift more taxes onto them because right now they're at their limit right now. They can't uh, even afford to open the doors now. Correct. And that's why in number two, for example, you have what's called band one and band two. So band one, so essentially the Eaton Center their first million dollars worth of assessment is taxed at a particular rate, and that's intended to protect smaller businesses. So a smaller business would benefit by that more. And then the rest of their value, their current value assessment, is taxed at a different rate, beyond the million dollars. So everybody gets the break on their first ban. Uh, so we need to revisit that, because maybe a million dollars now to protect small businesses, small mom and pop shops and things like that, isn't enough. Maybe that number needs to increase and then we have the ability within that uh, to actually create some adjustments where we can further extend some, uh, um, some protections to them. Because, because I agree with you, a, a viable city can only be viable if you have a very, very healthy small business class that's doing well. Another uh, question on your motion. The $1 million uh, band, uh, what does that mean, the $1 million, uh, the, the business va value, the... Uh, yeah, exactly. So what happens is, is the way it works now is we have two bands of assessment in the commercial industrial class. So you have your first band, which is a million dollars. So up to a million dollars worth of assessment, you get taxed at a particular rate. But that's so a property so, uh, assessment? The property is a property value, correct. Your property... So because we, we tax, we levy taxes against assessment. Assessed value. Assessed value. Okay. So your first million dollars worth of value get you at a different tax rate, get you at a particular tax rate, and then everything beyond that is at a, at a, at a higher rate, essentially. Okay, that's that, fine. That's intended to protect. Hey, thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Councillor Wong Tam to speak. Uh, yes, thank you very much, Madam Speaker. And I do have a motion. The clerks can put that on the screen for us. Uh, it's to direct the city manager to convene an impact response working group with financial planning staff and industry experts to assess and report to the executive committee in the second quarter of 2020 on the next phase of surging assessments anticipated from impact and such report to include consultation with councillors with high density zones or high growth areas. Um, Madam Speaker, this is um, uh, once again that time of year uh, where we actually determine the values of city council um, because uh, there is no higher um, uh, policy document than the budget. It sort of sets into motion everything else we do in the city, whether it's uh, uh, anti-black racism strategy, anti-poverty reduction strategies, uh, how to reduce gun violence, how to uh, implement road safety. It all comes back to the core uh, piece of, of work that 
the budget committee uh, led by Councillor Crawford uh, and, uh, and his incredible team have, have done at this point in time. And Madam Speaker, what's so, what I think is so encouraging about this particular budget uh, is that it has been largely uncontroversial. I, I think that's a, a remarkable change to, to be to, to, to where we once were. Uh, where everything was electric hot at this time of year. Um, and, uh, and great credit must be given to, to Mayor Tory uh, as well uh, for, for being very proactive and also listening and working with everybody. Um, we, we, saw, uh, we saw the mayor introduce the, uh, uh, the city building uh, levy in, in terms of enhancing it and, and, and accelerating it. Uh, and, uh, and we had a very sophisticated discussion about what the city needed in order for us to meet our, our goals. And that includes building uh, high order transit and includes affordable um, housing. So this is, uh, this is largely, I think, um, perhaps the dawn of a new era. And we've been heading to, to this place for some time. I recognize that we're still going to be tussling over what are the right revenue tools, and certainly I don't anticipate that that will go away anytime soon, but I am really appreciative of, of the discourse. Um, Madam Speaker, my motion has everything to do with the fact that uh, there are some councillors uh, I know that have been, have been meeting with MPAC, and we've already gotten heads up that there are significant changes that are coming uh, to the assessment uh, world. Not necessarily how they're assessing, they're still using the same methodology, same algorithms. They're gonna still put out the same process. But the numbers, the numbers that will, that will be produced, that will be made public in short order, is going to probably knock the socks off of some of our residents, including those who are condominium high-rise owners. That particular sector, Madam Speaker, those residents are going to see a disproportionate hit on their tax bill very shortly. So we have seen small businesses struggle with the highest and best use of valuation and what happens to Main Streets when those character small operated independent businesses collapse in distressed retail environments one by one by one. It's not just the high property taxes, it's also the fact that on online retail has, ent has entirely uh, sort of cannibalize some of the more struggling uh, resident sort of commercial areas. But the next, the next big crisis that is going to hit homeowners are, is, is that of, of those who live in high-rise apartments. So the impact response group, uh, I think, would be, would be one way for us to get in front of it, to make sure that we actually have our financial uh, planning staff uh, focused in working with industry experts, and hopefully in consultation with councillors who represent those, those areas. And I would include that would be Midtown, would be North York, uh, and of course the downtown communities, and wherever you see the high growth and high density buildings, uh, we are going to have to work really hard roll up our sleeves and get in front of it. And we're gonna to have to get super, super creative, Madam Speaker, on how to actually help the residents brace for that change. And uh, with that, I submit you my motion. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, last speaker, Mayor Tory. Well, thank you, Speaker. Uh, and I wanna thank the members of council for a, uh, a good debate today. You know, there was reference made earlier on to us taking the next step. And I think that, um, you know, you're always looking for what the next step is, but I think in some respects, as it regards 2019 and 2020, um, we've taken the next step, and many members have made reference to the initiative uh, to bring in the uh, modifications to the city building uh, fund and the levy. And I think that it was a significant next step. Uh, the council heartily endorsed it, and I think w one of the reasons it's been broadly accepted by the people across the city is because it is reasonable. It is reasonable both in the context of the quantum of it, and I realize for some people that, that even that reasonable quantum will pose some additional strain for them, but it's reasonable in terms of the quantum, and it's also reasonable within the context of what it's for, which I think has clearly been spelled out to people. It's for housing and transit and specific plans in that regard. Um, and I think it's also reasonable relative to other proposals that are made uh, from time to time. But people often ask in the context of the tax rate for this year and the city building levy and all of that taken together, you know, what caused uh, circumstances to change such that as a number of the speakers have noted, including just now uh, uh, Councillor Wong Tam, what caused things to change? Well, I think what caused things to change, and there's always a lot of complicated explanations for these things, is that we finally had uh, a transit plan, first of all, that was one, we've had transit plans before, as we well know, but we had one 
that the other two governments seemed determined to buy into uh, with significant uh, financial commitments. And so whatever we may think of how we got there, the bottom line is that three governments were all saying, OK, we've agreed on what we're going to build and who's going to pay for it. And I think that meant that uh, we then uh, had to uh, and, and, and the mechanics of all that allowed us to take some of our money, as it were, that we had raised now and in the future and apply it to the state of good repair, recognizing it's not everything we need by any means, but it's a start uh, on a number that had just been going up and up and up indefinitely. The second thing we had is we finally had a housing plan, and thanks to uh, the efforts of Deputy Mayor Bailo and many others in the staff and, and, and the federal government having a national housing strategy, we finally had a plan with, with targets bought into by everybody for affordable and supportive housing. And again, it was necessary for us to answer that one question that was left out of both the transit plan discussion and the affordable housing plan discussion, which is, how are you going to pay for your share? And so with the city building fund, we, we answered that question. And I think it's left us now in a position where we can look at those things, not as having been fully addressed, but where we've taken the first step, to use that expression again, a major step forward in allowing me, for example, as the principal advocate for funding from the other governments to go to them and say, our money's on the table, we've determined how it's going to be raised, we've spelled it out, we've notified the citizens, we've passed it at City Council, now um, how can you uh, join with us to make sure that this stuff gets done? So that leaves us then with the operating budget uh, property tax increase, and of course, we, we still have the obligation that I don't think did change, notwithstanding that we took a hard look at the need for long-term funding for housing and transit, and we had to say, well, what's the right level of property tax increase for the rest of the, the operating budget, as it were? And I think the number, the rightness of the number that is around the rate of inflation did not change and has not changed, and that is why you have a budget here that uh, Councillor Crawford worked so hard on and that I was his partner on that presents exactly uh, what uh, we told people would be presented. And I think it is reasonable uh, within the context of, uh, of it giving us, uh, notwithstanding that it is limited to the rate of inflation, the flexibility beyond the city building fund to invest in frontline services for people. And you know, there's a lot of people who comment that somehow when you even bring in that kind of a property tax increase, it's being used to kind of lard this place up. Well, let me just tell you again, so that it's more for the public's benefit than you, you know, you've read it. it, it, it the, 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 the amounts of money we're talking about here, the incremental tax increase is going to pay for frontline services. 86% of the jobs, for example, that will be created, the new positions created by this budget are frontline jobs. 121 bus and subway and streetcar drivers, 300 police officers. 60 some odd paramedics, and the list goes on. Librarians to staff uh, the youth spaces that are going to be newly uh, created by this budget. So I, I would say to people that this is reasonable, as is reasonable the fact that we are going to have an operating spending increase exclusive of debt service charges of 1.6% this year, with a 3% average over the six budgets that Councillor Crawford and I have worked on together. And I think that is, that is a reasonable number in a city that is the fastest growing city in North America. And so I think we have to continue to craft budgetary policy that balances revenue expenditures, we're required to do that by law, that balances the need to invest uh, and, and, and the tax we have to impose to raise the money to pay for that, which I think we've done both with the city building fund and separately with the rate of inflation tax increase we're about to vote on now. And I think the final question we have to keep asking, and a number of people have made reference to this, is what is the appropriate balance in terms of what property taxpayers should be asked to pay uh, for services that in many cases should not be the responsibility of the uh, municipal uh, level of government. So I will just say that I think that we, in passing this tax uh, levy number, are taking a city that is today a global success story. It is a globally recognized success story. And we are doing what we have to do to continue to invest in and protect that success. We are producing enough money to do that in the long term and in the short term operating. And I'm proud of the work that has been led by Councillor Crawford on that and commend to you all of the motions, which by the way, I will support that have been put forward today, but also the core uh, tax increase recommendation that is put to people as something that I think is fair and balanced and allows us to protect the success that is Toronto today. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Okay. Um. Vote on motion one first by Councillor Peruzza. Uh, there's been a request that uh, number three bo uh, be voted on separately. Yes, okay. So we'll um, vote on three. Recorded vote.
Councillor Ainsley, please, and Councillor Bradford, thank you. Part three of the motion carries 15 to nine. Okay, the remainder recorded. Pardon? You want, you want to reopen it? Okay, move, move by Councillor Ford to reopen. All in favor? Okay, okay then, uh, hold on, hold on. Councillor Perks then will reopen. Councillor Perks, yes. Okay, so <clears throat> part three again. Councillor Wong Tam, please. Part three of the motion carries 15 to nine. With the same vote. It was the same vote. Yeah, somebody. Okay, so on the remainder of the motion, recorded vote. Parts one, two, and four of the motion carry unanimously 24 in favor. Okay, motion two by Councillor Wong Tam. All in favor? Carried. Carried. Item is amended, recorded vote. Councillor Crawford, please. The item is amended, carries 21 to three. Okay. So we'll go to EX 13.2. Questions. Do we have questions? Pardon? You want a presentation? Does staff have a presentation? Okay, there is a, let's just go to question. Councillor Perks, question. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm not sure if this is to uh, housing or SSHA or the CFO. Um, in December, council debated and approved a new housing plan. One of the elements of that housing plan was to bring a report uh, next year, this year on creating a housing commissioner. Is there a line anywhere in the budget that would fund the creation of that housing commissioner's office currently? Through the speaker, no, currently there is not a line. What we will be reporting out on how we incorporate that function into our city structure and at that time, um, in order to implement it and follow council's directions to start that position in 2020 or that function in 2020, We'll work with the CFO to identify for 2020 
a reserve fund that we can draw, such as the housing reserve, and then incorporate it into the base budget for 2021. For, for 2021? We will start the Because function. we don't have anything in 2020, right? There's not, there's no, I can't point to a line anywhere in this budget where that position exists. Count, the council directed us when they adopted the plan to establish the function in 2020, which we will do. They also asked us to report back on how best to do that. Right. With that report back, we'll be better able to estimate the resources required. Yes, I, I understand that. Um, but it would be, but there's no money in this budget to do that. That's correct. We haven't budgeted a new and enhanced in this budget, but there are still monies remaining in our housing reserve that we might tap into for the portion of 2020. And that would require amending the budget if we decide to do that. It, yes. would, it would, would require an in-year adjustment. And we okay, work with the thank CFO you. To, do that. Uh, to shelter housing and support, we, I was asking questions along these lines uh, at budget committee, oh, the budget chief would have to remind me how long ago it was, and you identified that you do have a reserve that would have room. What was the name of that reserve, please? Uh, through the speaker. Uh, we have a social housing reserve fund. And you identified that there's money available within there should it be needed for this purpose. That is correct. Thank you very much. Those are my questions, speaker. Thank you. Councillor Cresty. Uh, well, thank you, Speaker. And just a heads up to uh, city staff, I'll be asking questions of Children's Services and then to our Medical Officer of Health. Uh, to our GM and Children's Services, uh, how many people are on subsidies currently in the City of Toronto? Through the Speaker, currently there's 30,700 fee subsidies in the City of Toronto. 30,700. And how many people are on the waiting list for subsidies in the city? Um, currently, as of today, our waiting list is 13,740. And I'm happy to say that is down from December uh, 2019 when it was over 15,000. 13,740. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand that in a change from the provincial government, there was a reduction in 15 million this year towards subsidies. Is that correct? That's correct. And was there any one-time mitigation funding provided this year? That's correct. The um, one-time change in the growth and expansion uh, was a result of a policy change that um, was related to the cost share. The province did provide another $12.3 million in one-time core funding to offset that, which resulted in a net reduction of $2.8 million. So the provincial government reduced our money for subsidies for childcare by $2.8 million this year? That's correct. And how many subsidies is $2.8 million? That's approximately 186 subsidies. 186. And are we covering within this proposed city budget the provincial cut this year? That's correct. The uh, city is making a net contribution this year that is ensuring that those 186 subsidies are not eliminated. Okay. And if there is no further mitigation of, uh, and everything stays the same, will there be a $15 million reduction next year? Uh, that's correct. If the one-time uh, mitigation is not applied next year the, and everything else remains the same, approximately $15 million reduction. From the province, a $15 million reduction next year if everything stays the same. And that would impact how many subsidies next year? Uh, approximately 1,160 fee subsidies. Okay. So, but just to reaffirm, the provincial cut this year of $2.8 million, we are absorbing. The cities, our tax, our city taxpayers are paying for the provincial cut. The city's net contribution has been increased to ensure that those uh, 186 subsidies are not eliminated. Okay. And to the medical officer of health, is Dr. Davila here? Uh, Dr. Davila, um, before SARS happened, what was the cost share formula between the provincial government and this city for public health funding? So uh, through the speaker, there have been a number of changes to the cost funding uh, relationship between the province and the city. Uh, at one point it was 50-50 uh, and it has changed over time until last year where there were 100% provincially funded programs and some 75-25 funded programs, 75% provincial, 25% uh, city. So prior to last year and following SARS, some provincial programs were funded 100% and others 75%. Is that correct? The speaker, that is correct. Okay. Now there's been some changes, so I just want to get some clarity here. 
in April there was a provincial announcement that Toronto's cost share would revert back to 50-50. Is that correct? Over time, that is correct. And that would have resulted in an annual reduction of how much from the province to us had that gone forward? Well, it would have changed through the speaker over time. In the outset, it would have been $65 million uh, per year and then closer to $100 million after. Okay, so it would have grown to $100 million. Now, that decision, that announcement was reversed, is that correct? Through the speaker, that is correct. And in August of this year, the province announced a new cost share reduction for the city, is that right? Through the speaker, yes. The province uh, announced that it would be changing the cost, the um, funding relationship with the uh, various local public health units such that the 100% programs would be eliminated, 100% provincial programs would be eliminated, and all local public health units would move to a 70-30 cost split. 70-30 cost split. Once fully implemented, what will the annual reduction for the city be at that 70-30 model? So through the speaker holding other things constant, it was rough, a little over $14 million a year to us at the City of so Toronto. So a $14 million provincial cut to Toronto Public Health starting in what year? Uh, starting in 2020. Starting in 2020. This year, what is the cut this year because there was some one-time mitigation funding? That is correct. So the 70-30 change moves us over to a $14 million cut. However, there was a one-time mitigation funding provided by the province for 2020, just under $10 million. So then the city's increased portion for 2020 is $4.3 million. And so can I ask, like the, uh, child, like the ch children's services budget in front of us, is the city of Toronto through the tax base absorbing that $4.3 million cut the province implemented this year? Okay, that was your speaker, last question. Yes. Through the speaker, yes. Thank you. Councillor Bradford. Thank you, Madam Speaker. A um, couple questions for the TTC. A um, number of these were discussed. I'll just give you a second to get down here. Uh, at the commission this year, as we, uh, we discussed. Sure. Thank you. Okay. Great. Uh, thanks very much. Um, through the speaker, uh, at deputations this year, at both at uh, TTC and as we did budget consultations across the city, uh, we got a lot of questions um, and deputations specifically related to TTC's fares. And I wanted to uh, to ask some questions here at council uh, to the TTC. So I was wondering if you could just at a high level kind of walk us through which fares are proposed to be changed this year in the TTC's budget. So through the speaker, uh, all fares uh, will be increasing by 10 cents, except for the adult cash fare that'll stay at $3.25. Okay, and, and what is the percentage discount currently on our concessions, uh, for our concession passes, so youth and seniors? One third, uh, it's roughly one third. Okay. How, um, from the TTC's perspective, how do we currently make decisions around our fare increases uh, year over year and, and what those, cha those changes look like? What's that process entail? So through the speaker, uh, we would look at uh, essentially what um, is available to us in terms of our overall funding. We would look at whether in fact there's been a fare increase in the past and we would then examine uh, what would be the best balance around the equity of what we could provide uh, in terms of the, that kind of uh, increase. But to date, is it, practically speaking, is it a year-by-year -year process, budget-to-budget, -budget, where we ad adjust actually based on the needs? Through the speaker, yes, that's true. And in fact, in this budget, we are, uh, there's a, a recommendation for, spend, for some funding that will actually look at a multi-year fair policy something that the city has asked the TTC to do for a series of years so we could have a multi-year view on uh, what a fair uh, increase might look like if that we could all plan for. 
I think that's helpful because it is frustrating coming back each year and, and, and going through this process of a fare increase. Uh, and, and it does seem like it, it's been very much calendar year, budget cycle to budget cycle. Uh, so with respect to that, and, and for the benefit of folks who haven't been at the TTC Commission, uh, this is the fair policy review that is currently underway. Through the speaker, yes, that's, that's true. That's before us as a noon investment. So it's a fair policy review and then an appropriate collection strategy to follow that. Could you tell me what things specifically at a high level the TTC is going to okay, be looking at? Okay, I'm sorry. I have to put your time on hold. There is an awful lot of noise in the council chambers. Please. Members of council, staff, everyone. Thanks, Madam Speaker. Okay, go ahead. Yep. Uh, so with respect, I, I just want to unpack that a little bit. The fair policy review, what exactly is it that you're going to be looking at uh, when you're bringing that forward? So through the speaker, not only will we be looking at our fair structure to determine what's the most efficient and effective way <laughs> at, a, at creating a, a fair structure, but we will also be working with our partners in the GTHA to look at what also helps support fair integration. Does this, um, does this also respond to the need for unified definitions across uh, how we would define, you know, seniors or child riders across uh, the Presto system uh, and all the different cities and municipalities that are using that? Through the speaker, that's correct. And that's part of the fair integration uh, strategy. Okay. And could you just tell me uh, when we're expecting the fair policy review to come back before us, before the commission? Okay. Uh, through through the speaker probably by year's end. Okay, so we'll have that, the, the, uh, the expectation is to have that going into the 2021 budget cycle. Absolutely. Wonderful, those are all my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Councillor Pasternak. Yes, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, through you to our transportation staff, I think everyone's in agreement here that uh, pedestrian and traffic safety is uh, perhaps one of the top two issues in, in the city. Uh, we have a situation in which, I guess this past year, we put about 21 million into operating. Uh, we're taking these uh, requests very seriously over at the Infrastructure and Environment Committee to respond to, uh, to fund Vision Zero. Um, could you just outline the new staff compliments that are coming in to help expedite uh, some of the safety strategies in Vision Zero that we're hoping to roll out a little more quickly this year? Uh, through the speaker, yes, we've asked through this budget for 15 additional staff to accelerate the delivery of our existing Vision Zero 2.0 program. And those staff will be uh, in uh, dealing with mid-block crossings and traffic signals, geometric safety improvements, um, as well as data to make sure that we are having an effect on, uh, on the overall program. So automated speed enforcement uh, has been uh, deployed. Um, now, that's on a pilot project uh, arrangement with the province. Can that be yanked after the initial data comes in? Through the speaker, the automated speed enforcement program that we're working on under the um, auspices of the, of the province, uh, they will come in in a six months' time uh, to evaluate our, our outcomes, which is why we are very specific about uh, making sure that we've deployed it in a way that is completely consistent with their approach, uh, and we will be collecting data and be able to provide that back to, uh, to that assessment when it's uh, time for it to be done. And just following up on some questions I asked an executive, um, uh, school zones or safety community zones, school zones embedded in neighborhoods um, aren't, we're not, we're not seeing the high speeds as, as parents uh, bring their kids to those schools. We're seeing distracted driving, uh, congestion, illegal parking. I've toured many schools. What happens if, uh, if the automated speed enforcement does not uh, issue a certain volume of tickets. Is that program canceled by the province or can we redeploy and try it again? What's, what's the arrangement? 
Well, the uh, 50 cameras that we put in place are mobile cameras, and so we've deployed them as, as required in community safety mm -hmm. zones, uh, all of which include one or more schools, many of which go just beyond the boundary of the school zones to include arterial roads where speeding is a challenge, especially in proximity to schools. So we will continue to work to move those around to er areas in the ward. There are two deployed per ward where we've identified uh, a series of issues related to speeding and safety and the number of students who are walking to school to ensure that we have uh, some safety outcomes. Okay, all right, thank you very much. My next question is for uh, the general manager of Parks, Forest and Recreation. Uh, a big, big project in Downsview, uh, the Downsview Park uh, Community Center uh, was adopted in, in principle as a policy under the Downsview Secondary Plan, which was adopted 10 years ago. Uh, it is not on the uh, current capital plan. Uh, so is to, it? Through you, Madam Speaker, to, to clarify, so the uh, Downsview Community Center, which was uh, approved as part of the Parks and Recreation Facilities Master Plan, uh, it doesn't. It doesn't appear in the this ten-year capital plan. It does appear in the following ten-year capital plan, based on the staging and the development plans around that particular community. But it does also. Uh, uh, there's a proviso within the facilities master plan indicating that if there was external funding, whether it be provincial or federal, uh, to advance that project, we would uh, we would advance it as that funding becomes available. It has been included in the list of uh, projects for funding that has been submitted as part of the infrastructure funding initiative. Okay, so if we have the other two levels of government coming up with, let's say, a third and a third, that can be the reinserted in the capital plan. Through the speaker, that's correct, and it would be the same for a number of other capital projects that have been uh, submitted as part of that that funding proposal. Now there is money in escrow uh, for the Downsview Community Center. It's about 1.1 million. And a suggestion has come up that we could use that for design work. Uh, is there any, are there any barriers to using those funds for design work, even though it's not in the capital plan? Through the speaker, if, if there was a need to start the design work early on the community center, uh, you know, we can certainly bring those funds forward through, uh, through uh, an in-year uh, capital budget adjustment as needed. So section 37 motion and working that's, with that's staff correct. to try and. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Okay. Uh, Thank you, that was the last of your question. Um, <clears throat> Councillor Thompson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Madam Speaker. I have questions for children's services, social development and finance, and then the TTC. So first questions for uh, children's services. Um, with respect to the core responsibility for childcare, is that a primary responsibility for the city, or is it, um, in fact, a shared responsibility? Uh, through the speaker, it's a shared responsibility, and in fact, approximately 80% of the funding for childcare is provincial. Okay, thank you. And um, when we look at um, the expansion of the service. I know that often I'm told or asked by residents, why doesn't the city just fund the full expenditure for childcare? H how do you respond to that? Um, uh, through the speaker, the uh, City of Toronto has a, an ambitious 10-year growth strategy, which looks to add childcare spaces, childcare subsidies, and improve affordability for family. Families. It, it's, it's quite an ambitious plan. Okay. Uh, right up front in that strategy, uh, we were clear that we needed investments from all three levels of government in order to achieve those targets. Um, and the primary um, heavily weighted on provincial and federal investments. Thank you very much. Uh, through to social development and finance. Uh, in this budget, there's uh, $2.1 million being allocated, 100000 for the BRAVE program and so on. I'm not going to touch the BRAVE program, I know what that is, I did bring that forward and I'm very happy that the, the, we're providing some funding for the pilot. Yeah. But with respect to the $2 million sure. that's being allocated for uh, 10 communities across the city, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. And, and how will uh, residents and um, individuals be able to apply in order to access the uh, $2 million and what will be the criteria in terms of monitoring, measuring, outcome and so on? 
So it takes um, the community funding staff within my division about six to eight weeks to develop and implement and roll out a new funding program. Um, this funding can program- it be, Can it be any faster? Uh, we will work very okay. fast to get this out, uh, understanding uh, the necessity and the yes. readiness in many communities for this, this kind of resourcing. Um, certainly, part of the process would be developing the criteria and the materials, just uh, sending that out okay. to communities across the city and um, having a process where we are reviewing and shortlisting the proposals, okay. including community participation and particularly youth participation. On okay, this. that's fantastic, thank you. Um, in this budget, um, how many uh, new additional space are we going to see for youth hubs? How many new spaces for yeah, youth, for youth hubs? hubs? Yeah. I think it would be better for my colleague from Parks and Rec. Too. Okay, fantastic, thank you, thank you. Uh, through the speaker, so the, the current uh, budget uh, has uh, four youth hubs in it al already, and I understand right. there's also a motion from executive committee uh, to, to add, add some more. To, to add so that's a total of six uh, plus four, which is ten in this fiscal year. Okay. So we go. Is the question around the process around how? Do no, we I don't want. To, I know the process. I just wanted to know the numbers. So there's so 10, ten, and they're uh, budgeted at approximately two hundred thousand dollars each in the Okay, budget. that's great. Thank you. So my next question is for the TTC. How many uh, um, fair inspectors does the TTC currently have dealing with fair version? So through the speaker, uh, in total, we have 111 fair inspectors. Uh, in the last uh, 19 budget, uh, council approved 70. And so they are currently under um, recruitment, most of them. And then we also have enforcement officers. I'm sorry? Enforcement officers. Right. Uh, and in this budget, how many will we see? 123, we are requesting 50 in this budget, so that brings it to 123. So in total, it's uh, 234. 234. Yes. And can you tell me, um, what's the budget, and, and I don't want the TTC's budget, but the budget that's utilized for, uh, I'll use the term corporate security and security in general, that would include the fair in inspectors and so on, and fair in, and in enforcement officers. What's the total budget that's being spent? Question. Is there another question that you want to ask? That's all I have for the TTC at the moment. Okay. Sorry. About 20 million in total? 20 million for that piece in terms of security. Total security. Total security. Total Include system security. All system security, all security. 20 million. TTC. Okay, yes. great. Thank you, Speaker. Thank you. Okay, um, before we recess, um, I'd like to ask the mayor. mayor I, I believe that you have a special presentation to make. And Councillor Pasternak? Yeah, Councillor Pasternak. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, we just got word uh, a couple of days ago that someone who's been with the city for 33 years, Richard Ubbins, is retiring and moving on to other opportunities. So after this 33-year career with the City of Toronto, he's leaving the city, he's, expected a, he's accepted a position with the TRCA. Now, I'm happy to say I'm on the TRCA, so I'll still be there. So Richard first joined the Toronto Public Service in 1987 as a program planning administrator in urban forestry. In 1995, he became city forester and subsequently held the position of director of forestry until 2010. Since that time, Richard has served as director of parks. So Richard was instrumental in development of the execution of the two multi-park parks plan, as well as Toronto's ravine strategy and the strategy's implementation plan allowing for new investments and partnerships to be directed toward the protection and stewardship of Toronto's ravines. He oversaw the response work on high lake, high lake levels of 2017 and 2019 and championed the mitigation efforts undertaken to repair and prevent further damage to the waterfront. Richard's expertise and dedication has served the people of Toronto well over the years. I vaguely remember, I distinctly remember the 2013 
uh, ice storm where there was severe damage to our tree canopy. And Richard was under enormous pressure to have a response to it and rebuild it. And he's done a remarkable job. I have seen him uh, in other countries at conferences as a noted speaker. And of course, uh, I will be seeing him at the TRCA in the years ahead. He's been an invaluable member of the Toronto Public Service. And we appreciate all he has done in the last three decades of the city. Thank you so much for your contribution to the city, taking on these vital policy areas and all the accomplishments you have done. And I'd like to uh, now invite the mayor to say a few words. And perhaps, uh, Richard, while I'm saying a few words, you might come down because we have something to, uh, to give with you. It's the usual. It's not the keys to a new car or a gold watch, but uh, it's something that uh, carries with it equal meaning. You know, I, I will just, in echoing the words of Councillor Pasternak, I will just say that um, uh, it is uh, rare that you get the opportunity to thank someone for their public service and, and have some of the issues that you talk about be issues that are so much related to the future of the city. And if you look at, uh, for example, uh, the work on the tree canopy, the work on tree planting, the work on the maintenance, even in the aftermath of something as horrible as the ice storm, of something that is a proud natural feature uh, of the city, world recognized. Uh, if you look at uh, the resilience efforts that we've had to make, the mitigation efforts we've had to make in the aftermath of rising uh, water levels, undoubtedly caused in part by climate change and the work that was done there uh, when there was a threat posed to the Toronto Island, as Councillor Cressy knows uh, so well, uh, or if you look at the ravine strategy, which is something that is uh, a recent, I think, very proud accomplishment of this council, which is not only in this budget, in fact, which not only have we had a strategy that was put in place in 2017, which Richard had a big hand in developing, but now an implementation plan and funding uh, to go with it. These are things that speak to the next 25, 50 uh, years of the city and making sure that our natural uh, assets, precious natural assets that are globally recognized are preserved and enhanced. Um, and that goes uh, beyond, uh, that, that is in addition to all the day-to-day -day work that you've done just doing uh, your job on the myriad of other things that you've attended to. And so um, this, uh, you know, comes with our uh, respect and our uh, affection and our uh, gratitude for your efforts that have been undertaken your, and with best wishes for uh, your future career and, and many thanks for everything you've done uh, in a position of leadership with the city. Thank you so much. Yeah, well, that was all ra rather sudden and uh, unplanned today. Um, I'll be very brief as a result. <laughs> I would just like to say that um, it has been an extreme privilege to serve the public of Toronto, to serve the councillors here at the City of Toronto, and to be part of such a magnificent team of public servants. Um, those of you who know me well know that uh, I, I don't think there's a better job, a, a more honorable job than being a public servant um, and serving the public directly uh, the way we can at the municipal level. And so uh, that has, uh, that was a surprise to me. I, I thought I'd be working in Northern Ontario somewhere as a forester. My wife is also a forester. Um, and instead, uh, I ended up here at the City of Toronto, and I realized soon after uh, probably my 10th or 11th public meeting of hundreds over the years um, that there's no better place to teach the public and to, uh, to uh, encourage the public to, about the uh, natural environment of the city, the urban forest and its parks and rivers and so on, waterfront uh, and air, uh, than in the City of Toronto. Uh, there just isn't a better place in the country, and we've been able to be a model. Uh, I, I, sit on, I sit on the board of the City Parks Alliance um, in the States, and um, I can tell you that uh, Toronto is a model uh, that they look uh, toward. They consider us uh, one of the best park systems in North America, according to the uh, Public Lands Park Score. Um, and they look at Toronto as, as, as a model, uh, not only for its urban forest, but also for its park system, its ravines, its waterfront, and the way that we look after them here. And uh, as a forester, I was trained to look 100 years plus in the future, and that's always been what I've done, and I've been privileged to do that with 
uh, professional colleagues uh, from many other divisions, uh, planning, transportation, solid waste, water, and so on. And I, I've, I've just been very blessed to have so many great colleagues, professionals, uh, who are really doing a great job and to serve you all here. And, and thank you very much. This is very unexpected. Thank you. Thank you. So on that note, we recess to 2 o'clock.